Lisa Kime has the best pictures. It's a nice background. Beautiful. I wonder what that river is behind where you usually is testifying from. Yeah, I know. Looks like a good trout stream. That, that must be um, up on Katahdin, Katahdin or something, huh? Well, I don't think it's quite that high. Here she no, is. it isn't. It isn't Lisa, that high. What is that ridge, Lisa? Um, it's White Cap. It's one of my favorite hikes in my district. It's so easy. It's it's pretty easy to do, and I do it all year round. So yeah. I actually had a picture of the winter one, and then I thought, well, it's not quite as pretty. But I, um, we when we were away, uh, we were robbed actually, and um, oh. so I lost my PC that had all of my photos on it. So this is a new one. I don't have my stream picture anymore. It just happened, you mean? Yeah, it did. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I lost yeah. a lot, including my PC and my phone. And so. About oh, what, jewelry and stuff. What a way to come home. Yeah, wow. I know. You lose your jewelry and things like that? Um, I, tr I do travel really light, so that's good. Um, and so the only, only thing I had for jewelry I was wearing. So we were off hiking and um at a hot springs actually so we had set our bag aside with our shoes and all that because we were in it sitting in the hot spring and someone went over to our backpack and stole the keys out of it and then they hiked back out of this of the you know from the trail and we're not started yet so whatever um i mean i know we're online but who cares um yeah, and then they just pushed the button to find the car, and they just they just took everything from the car. So I thought you meant while you were away, they um, broke into your home. No, no, they um, nope, they broke into the rental car, so they just emptied the rental car. So, gosh, sorry. Jeez. Yeah. Um, well, what is what is that river that you that you were sitting in front of you? Uh, the Swift River. Oh, that's the Swift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. You didn't. You haven't canned all the gold out of there, have you? <laughs> I haven't, but you know, I have tried. I did yeah. I did go gold panning in it. It was yeah. pretty fun, but I didn't get a darn thing, but it was fun to do. Yeah, my son. But pe up. people set up like, like, I don't know, equipment right in the river and it sifts through and all that. And I, yeah, people are really into it. Yeah, that's why we can't find even a fleck when we go because they right. get the pump suction things. That's yeah. what they're doing, yeah. yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have a very, very busy day today um, with lots of people who want to testify on important bills. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. The Democratic caucus ran over a bit, but I see that we do have a quorum, uh, so I am going to start us off. Uh, good morning to uh, committee members and all attendees who are in the waiting room. And to anybody watching online, my name is Tom Harnett, and I serve as the House Chair of the Judiciary Committee, and I welcome you to today's meeting. As many of you know by now, we're conducting meetings electronically. This is available uh, via Zoom and the legislature's YouTube channel, um, and it will be recorded and available at the end of the day um, in case there are parts that you miss or want to rewatch. Uh, I would ask people, both attendees and panelists, to make sure that their name on, on their computer is theirs, so that we know who we are talking to, uh, and not a nickname. Um, so if you could just take a look at that, that would be very much appreciated. I am going to start with introductions, and I'm going to call... Page. I'm sorry, um, Lisa Kime had a question. Senator Kime had a question. Okay, we we will be moving people in and out of the participant category as they as they respond. Move for Plymouth and Corona. Thank you, uh, um, Representative Reckett. 
What? I'm sorry, who's talking? Morning. Good morning. I'm uh, Representative Record from the Ocean End of South Portland, District 31. I think I think Lois might be in another committee right now. Sounds it. Lois, are you with us or with another committee? Okay, I'm going to continue with introductions and I'm just going to call on people in the order that they are listed on um, my panelist list, beginning with Representative Jeffrey Evangelos. Morning. Um, th thank you, uh, Chair Harnett. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, Representative Jeffrey Evangelos. Uh, I represent House District 91, Washington, Walderboro, Union, and Friendship. And um, uh, we're going to have a, a very informative day. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Senator Sanborn? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Heather Sanborn. I represent Senate District 28, which is half of Portland and half of Westbrook. And I'm gonna be leaving in about five minutes for half an hour and then I'll be back. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lisa Kime. Morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Kime and I am proud to represent Senate District 18, which is Northern Oxford County and two communities in Androscoggin. Thank you very much, Senator. Representative Moriarty. Top of the morning, everyone. I'm Steve Moriarty from House District 45, which is Cumberland and part of Gray. Thank you. And Representative Chris Babbage. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to all. My name is Chris Babbage. I represent House District 8, which is the town of Kennebunk. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Reckett. Yes, I'm uh, sort of here uh, from District 31 in uh, South Portland, Ocean End. I'm uh, in two places at once. So it's gonna be, I'm gonna have everybody muted and I'll be listening, but I'm gonna be have, having trouble talking. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Reckett. And again, my name is Tom Harnett and I serve as the house chair. I represent house district 83, which is the town of Farmingdale and the city of Gardner where I reside. Before getting into our public hearings, I just want to remind all that the chat function is used if one has technical questions. It is not part of the record. Uh, so comments placed in the chat um, have, have no weight as we move forward. Um, We're going to begin, we have three public hearings this morning. Uh, the first two will be combined as one because the bills are quite similar. And the way this will work is I will be calling on people to testify and my ABLE uh, committee clerk will be moving them in from the attendee room to become a panelist. Um, and then after they have finished testifying and answering questions from the committee, they will be moved back in as an attendee. I will hear, of course, from the sponsors co-sponsors and other legislators who will speak first. Then I will call on people who are testifying in support of the bill, then people testifying against the bill, and then testifying neither for nor against the bill. Um, and again, it's helpful for everyone to remember to mute your microphones unless you're speaking so we don't um, have too much background noise. And the last caveat is we have an awful lot of people testifying on our first two bills. All people testifying other than the sponsor will be limited to three minutes and we will have to enforce that in order to get through the day. So with that, I am now going to open the public hearing on LD 363 and LD 627. And I'm going to be uh, begin by calling on Representative Jeffrey Evangelos, who will be introducing LD363 on behalf of Representative Pluger. Representative Evangelos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, um, thank you, committee. Um, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and other distinguished members of the Jewish committee, I'm representing this bill for uh, Representative William Pluger from Warren who represents House District 95, which includes Appleton, Hope, Union, and Warren. I am here today um, speaking uh, for the representative 
to present LD 363, an act regarding the statute of limitations for injuries and harm resulting from PFAS contaminations. PFAS contamination is a growing problem across the state of Maine. Today, you will hear from farmers and homeowners whose lives have been upended due to the contamination. The contamination on the land happened years ago, in some cases, more than 20 years ago. All those impacted had no idea that the toxic substances were even on their land or in their water. Current Maine law gives them little recourse to get any help or compensation from those responsible uh, for the contamination. This bill will allow those that are impacted by PFAS contamination the ability to take legal action within six years of discovery of the pollution instead of six years after the pollution originally occurred as is currently written. That's a huge, huge distinction as uh, you will hear today. You have all likely heard of the heartbreaking stories about the contaminated farm in Arundel, Stone Ridge Farm, as well as the contamination of the Toja Farm in Fairfield. If you haven't, you will hear their stories today. However, farmers are not the only ones impacted by this issue. At last count, there are over 40 contaminated wells in Fairfield near the Toja Farm. This is in addition to families in Presque Isle, residents in Holton, and others across the state that are already dealing contamination with no solutions in sight. In my hometown of Warren, we are grappling with how to proceed on a site contaminated with PFAS and are currently assessing what the impact is to the community's groundwater. You will also hear some of the, their stories today. Passage of LD 363 would also provide an avenue for homeowners like these with contaminated drinking water wells, drinking water wells to seek damages. These stories are just the beginning. As more testing is done, we will find more contaminated land and water across the state. Under current Maine law, the cost of this pollution threatens to fall on farmers, landowners, and eventually Maine taxpayers as the cost of cleanup rises, and the land has to be abandoned to become uncontrolled hazardous waste sites. While Maine is a leader in many areas, we are behind the curve on this issue. 37 other states already have similar discovery rules in place that allow cases to proceed on the basis of when the pollution was discovered, as is proposed in LD 363, rather than when it first occurred. Additionally, updating this law and addressing this disparity is one of the many recommendations that came out of the governor's PFAS task force, January 2020. Passage of this bill is essential to ensuring that whoever created this mess will be responsible to pay to clean it up. Farmers and other impacted communities deserve the opportunity to seek justice for the harm done to them and their families. Uh, LD 363 uh, and the other bill, um, 627, uh, will give them that opportunity. I just, uh, that concludes the testimony. I wanna wish Representative Kluker and his family well. Um, the representative's in quite a bit of pain, um, suffered an injury on his farm and uh, um, I'm his neighbor, so. I do want to remind the Judiciary Committee um, that we heard similar legislation um, uh, two years ago. And, um, you know, the problem is um, the, at the point of uh, discovery, um, when you know something's wrong or you've become ill, um, the statute of limitations had expired. And um, that's, that's the issue here. Um, so we need to uh, align um, the actual uh, date of discovery um, with the people's right to seek justice. I think that's what's behind the bill. I'm not sure I'm the one qualified to ask your questions other than providing that background, um, but I'm sure others will follow Representative Harnett. Thank you, uh, Representative Evangelos. Are there any questions from the committee members for Representative Evangelos? Seeing none, I will move on and introduce the sponsor of LD. 627, Representative Wayne Perry. Welcome, Representative Perry, to the Judiciary Committee. Good morning, uh, Representative Arnatt and members of the Committee of Judiciary. My name is Wayne Perry. I represent House District 10, which covers Arundel, Dayton, and part of Lyman. I am here as sponsor of LD 627, an act related to the statute of limitations for injuries and harm resulting from perforal and polyfluorite substances of P PFAS. Um, I have brought this bill forward for my constituent, Fred Stone, um, as I also live in Arundel um, with Fred. Um, 
Fred's Farm was ground zero for this issue in Maine. When I started working with Fred a little over four years ago, we didn't realize that his farm was the tip of the iceberg. We are now seeing cases throughout the state. If you don't have a case in each of your districts, it is not because you don't have any, it's because they haven't been found yet. These PFAS's chemicals are nicknamed forever chemicals. So this is a long-term problem. The reason changing the statute of limitations is so important, none of these farms knew there was an issue. Actually, the environmental agencies told these farms the sludge they were spreading was safe. The farms were told it was safe, have, the farms that have been told it was safe have been destroyed. With this change, these farmers that have been affected will at least have an avenue for help. Those of you that were on the committee last year will recognize the bill. It was brought forward by former representative of my district, the Honorable Henry Ingerson. And because, but because of the COVID shutdown, the, the bill was never brought for, to the floor for passage. I told uh, Mr. Stone that if elected, I would, bring, I would follow Henry and bring the bill to the, to the uh, committee this year. Um, I instructed the revisor's office to draft the bill exactly how it came out of committee last summer. I wanted to get as close as possible to the committee that had already, the, what the work of the committee had already done. I believe this bill is hugely important for those affected already, but also those that do not know they have a problem yet. I would be happy to answer any questions, and, but I believe Mr. Stone and others affected farms are here and also several experts on this issue. They may be better job answering um, than I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Representative Perry. Uh, and again, it was nice to see you in front of our committee today. I don't know why my, my picture's not up, but <laughs> um, that, sometimes that, that, this stuff doesn't work quite as well as we, we like it to. We, we learn as we go along. Absolutely. Uh, it has its challenges. And uh, I do see some questions from, a, uh, from one committee member, Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Perry, good morning. It would help me uh, as we uh, commence this combined hearing in knowing for sure that there is no legal distinction between LD 363 and 627. It appears that way to me, but I need to hear it from. I, I believe they're of... identical bills. Uh, it looks like almost almost word for word um, the two bills, and I was hoping that the, when I put my bill forward, like I said, that it would come as close as it could to what the committee worked last year, um, and I requested the revisers do just that. So that's okay. That was I, my I goal. Have, I have the same impression. I just wanted to hear it uh, from you. Thank you. Good, thanks. Thank you, Representative Moriarty. Are there other questions from committee members? Seeing none, again, thank you very much, Representative Perry, for bringing this important bill uh, to our attention today. Thank you very much. Uh, I am now going to turn to other legislators that have asked to speak. And we have uh, only one as far as I know, and I would like to call on Representative Shelley Rudnicki, um, who is testifying neither for nor against. Representative Rudnicki, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm actually testifying for, um, okay. so if you are aware of that, thank you. Um, but good morning, uh, Representative Harnett and distinguished members of the Judici Judiciary Committee. I am State Representative Shelley Rudnicki. I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield. I'm here today to support both LD 363 and 627. I'm not here to talk about the science. There are a lot smarter people than I am to do that. I'm here to tell you about my friends and my neighbors. In July last year, I was informed as the state rep by the DEP that PFAS was discovered in the milk of a local farm and that they were investigating it and would keep me informed. In October, I was CC'd in a letter to the Fairfield town manager that some wells in Fairfield have tested high. Since that time, more and more wells have tested very high. The people in my community, my friends and neighbors are scared and angry about the PFAPS issue. They're concerned about their health, their property values, 
They're worried about their children, their grandchildren, and can we really blame them? My own well has not been tested. Um, it's not because I have not asked because several years ago I had a pipe break in my well and we switched to city water. But most of the people that are affected by this don't have that option. Um, I'm actually at the end of the line for city water. And I'm sure that many of these people don't want city water anyway. Until my immediate neighbor gets tested, I won't even know if, it's, if I had any possible exposure the first 15 years that I lived here. These bills will give folks recourse for injuries or harm now that they know that there is contamination. What if they can't sell their homes? What if they can't grow their gardens anymore? What if they can't go hunting on their own property? What if they can't raise animals? There needs to be recourse somewhere. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you may have, but I'm sure there are many, many more people behind me um, that will tell you um, exactly what they're going through and how um, this has affected them. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Representative Rudnicki. Um, are there members of the committee that have questions for Representative Rudnicki? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for testifying today. Uh, and I would like to, we've been joined by another committee member, uh, Representative David Hagan has joined us. Uh, Dave, uh, Representative Hagan, could you introduce yourself, please? I could, I think I lost my, my video thing, but uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm Dave Hagan, I uh, represent uh, District 101, Hamden and Newburgh, and I have to Apologize, I will have to step out periodically as the school district that I'm in is in, we have meetings dealing with what to do for the rest of the year. So I'll be in and out, my apologies. Thank you very much, Representative Hagan. I am now going, I'm sorry, we have a question from Representative Libby, did I? I just, I popped in, apologies, Mr. Chair, I popped in halfway through introductions earlier and didn't have a chance to introduce myself. Would now be an appropriate time? Oh, it, it would be. I apologize for missing that. <laughs> Thank you. I am Representative Laurel Libby. I am from Auburn and I represent District 64, which is part of Auburn and all of Minot. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And did I miss Representative Sheehan as well? Thought I'd pop in and do the same. My name's Erin Sheehan. I represent House District 12, that is uh, downtown Biddeford. Thank, Thank you. you. And again, I apologize for overlooking. Is there anybody else I overlooked in, on our committee? Seeing none, I will now move on to calling on people who are testifying in favor. And I want to remind you that I will be using the three minute timer and with about 15 seconds left, you'll see me hold it up and then I will ask you to wrap up after the three minute mark. Uh, it's the only way we'll be able to get through um, this hearing today in, in a timely fashion. And I will, to help my committee clerk, let her know the next four people who will be called on to testify. The first will be the Honorable Sharon Treat, followed by the Honorable Henry Ingerson, uh, Bruce Harrington and Catherine Harrington. So at this point, I would call on the former chair of the Judiciary Committee and my state representative for a while, um, the Honorable Sharon Tree, who will join us from cyberspace pretty quickly. You're on mute. Okay, and video as well. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee, I guess I won't be on the hook to bring you cookies since this is virtual. Uh, but my name is, <laughs> I, I know you will. My name is Sharon Treat and I live in Hollowell and I'm senior attorney for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And today I'm testifying in support of both of these uh, pieces of legislation. Um, IATP is a nonprofit headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, but with offices in Hollowell and other locations. And we work closely with farmers to promote local, sustainable, and environmentally beneficial agriculture. 
Maine's statute of limitations is out of date. It was conceived of without understanding the properties of PFAS chemicals, which silently and invisibly contaminate soil, water, plants, and livestock, bioaccumulate in food and in human bodies, and move great distances through groundwater persisting for a decade. Unlike statutes of limitations in 37 other states, Maine's law hasn't been updated to incorporate the discovery rule. Instead, the standard of within six years after the cause of action accrues is both ambiguous and somewhat circular text that could lead to further litigation and limit access to the courts. The mismatch between how PFAS acts in real life and the legal test in Maine's one size fits all statute of limitations is vividly illustrated by what's going on in the Fairfield um, and neighboring communities. There, dozens of drinking wells, if you have heard, have been contaminated with off the chart levels of PFAS chemicals. This contamination was only discovered recently because the State Department of Agriculture has begun testing retail milk as a result of the Arundel situation and was able to trace the spike of PFAS back to a particular farm. Critically, in the context of this bill, it's possible that this contamination was caused by sludge spread um, at, at a minimum of 15, 17 years ago. So in other words, there's no way for affected residents to know uh, when uh, their wells were contaminated with PFAS PFAS or when the contamination originally concern, happened or even where. PFAS have other properties that make the discovery rule particularly appropriate. Um, as I mentioned, they're very mobile and they can be found in high concentrations at great distances from where the contamination first occurred. And I hope you have a chance to look at my written testimony because I've included some maps that show that exact point in comparison to some other contaminants. Failure to fix the main statute of limitations could result in um, uh, a, a real um, dis injustice to, to people who've been affected, who do not just include, of course, these farmers, but those are farms that illustrate the, the actual real devastation that could occur um, in the result of, uh, of having uh, contamination. And I wanna mention that there are you know, significant health problems uh, linked to kidney and testicular cancer, um, thyroid disease, infertility, and compromised immune systems. So I believe that's a signal that my time is just about up or is up. It, 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 it is up. Um, okay, so I would just conclude in saying, you know, we lost a whole year because of the pandemic and passing this legislation. Really time is of the essence. It was ready to go to the floor um, this summer. And I really encourage all of you to vote in support of this bill, which is really needed legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Treat. It's very nice to see you again. And before we uh, open it up for questions uh, to Ms. Treat, uh, we've been joined by Representative Poirier. Um, if you could introduce yourself. I know you, you have a difficult day ahead of you, so you may be coming and going. Thank you, Chair Harnett. Um, I'm Jennifer Poirier. I represent House District 107, which is all of Skowhegan and part of Madison. Thank you very much. Um, and now I will open it up for questions from the committee for Ms. Treat. Uh, Representative Sheehan, I see you have a hand up. Is that still up from before? Okay, thank you. Uh, are there questions from the committee for Ms. Treat? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your testimony today and for the submission of written testimony, which we will uh, obviously read and consider as well. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. The next person uh, that would be testifying is the Honorable Henry Ingerson, who brought this very bill in the 129th. Um, it's very nice to see you again, Henry, and the floor is yours, and I'll start the timer when you start to speak. Thank you. Um, Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, esteemed members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judish. My name is Henry Ingerson. I live in Arundel, Maine, and I'm here today to testify in support of both LDs 363 and 627. I want to thank Representative Perry for carrying this forward, and also thank you to Representative Pluker. Um, I first became aware of PFAS in Maine when I met Fred and Laura down the road from my house. Stone Ridge Farm, as you know, has a hundred year old farm. It's been destroyed by PFAS contamination due to the spreading of sludge. 
Because of the terrible contamination at Stone Ridge and other places in Maine, Governor Mills con convened the PFAS task force in March 2019. The final report concluded many re recommendations, including this one. Quote, a majority, eight out of 11 of task force members recommended the legislature consider revising the statute of limitations for private claims to be within six years of discovery of PFAS contamination. Under current Maine law, individuals, businesses, farms, municipalities affected by PFAS may be prevented from seeking a civil remedy because the existing Maine statute for personal injury and damage to property is limited to six years from the occurrence of contamination. PFAS contamination in Maine due to the land spreading of sludge and other sources occurred decades before any individual became aware of the contamination and the harm. Therefore, this bill would simply add language to include that the action arising out of any harm caused by PFAS must be commenced within six years after the date the plaintiff discovers or should have discovered a harm or injury. In short, this bill would allow Maine citizens to seek civil remedy for up to six years from when the pollution is discovered and the harm is discovered, not from when the pollution happened. There are 38 other states that recognize such a discovery rule where people or property are injured by substances with latent harmful effects such as PFAS. It's very fitting that a discovery rule be enacted for PFAS because of its ability to bioaccumulate in soil and water and its persistence in the environment for a really, really long time. As we move forward to put into law the recommendations of the task force, we will likely discover more sites where PFAS contamination exists. From the 80s to 2000, over 225 locations statewide were permitted to receive industrial and sewage sludge. Since I first introduced this bill in July of 2020, a second dairy farm and 40 wells surrounding the area in Fairfield have been found to be severely contaminated with PFAS. In addition, drinking water has been found to be contaminated in Kennebunk, Presque Isle, Holton, and an elementary school in Trenton. At its heart, this bill is really about environmental justice for Mainers. Mainers who are already working hard to put food on the table and should not bear the cost for the damage to their health and livelihood for something that they knew nothing about and wasn't their fault. Like other states, Mainers should be able to have their day in court to face those deemed responsible. Those that knew decades ago that PFAS were harmful to health and did not break down yet chose to keep it a secret. I ask the Judiciary Committee to pass this recommendation, help make Maine a leader and a role model in protecting its private citizens from the damages to the environment, human health, and property due to toxic chemicals. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time today, and I really appreciate the work you're all doing. Thank you very much, and it's really nice to see you again, sir. To see you. It'd be nice to see you in person. Uh, <laughs> Uh, questions from the committee, beginning with Representative Evangelos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Henry. Nice to see Hi. you. Hi, Jeff. Henry, um, we refreshed my memory. Uh, this was, I believe we were in the House chamber as a Judiciary Committee and zooming in and um, you, um, we had a work session on this bill. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe, and, and maybe Representative Harnett could clarify, but um, we did have a hearing um, and the bill passed through the hearing at the end of July, 2020. And I believe it got voted out of committee and into a work session. I'm not sure it ever got through work session. Yeah, uh, either um, Representative Harnett, um, I wanted to find out um, if we voted ought to pass or not. I, my recollection is we did. I just wanted to know what the vote was if Peggy or somebody could get that. I'm just curious. Thank you for that. Sure. Peggy can get that for you. We did vote it out of committee is my, my recollection. Yes, I think it was seven to one out of committee and it was an amendment added to clarify the main tort claims act. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Thanks a lot. Sure. Are there any other questions for uh, the honorable uh, Henry Ingerson? Seeing none, thank you very much for testifying today and for sticking with this bill as, as you did in the 129th. Thank you. Uh, and just a note to the um, committee clerk, I will now just be working down the lists that you gave me, um, starting with um, Bruce Harrington. Hi, uh, my name is Bruce Harrington. This is all new to me. So uh, okay, I'm into, uh, I want to promote the bill LD363 and also LD627. Um, I've lived at my place for 37 years, 17 Howe Road, Fairfield, Maine. Um, it happens that our 
I hope you can see these, this paperwork. We're um, not seeing, uh, we, we do not see video. Okay, well, oh. anyways, um, they're saying that the, um, the rate on this should have been just 70. Oh, there we go. Should have been just 70. Well, what 26,000. Can you see that? We, we can hardly, hardly see that, but we don't, you can give us the numbers. We can't use props at, at okay. a hearing. Sorry. Right. So anyways, it, it's outrageous. It's a, it's an extremely high, high level. Um, the impact on myself and my family is health issues. Um, I don't want to go into all of them, you know, but I have a wife. I had three boys that lived here. Um, I have 14 grandchildren. They all come up. You know, we have a pool that was filled by our well water. Um, anything on the property there, we have an artesian well that overflows all the time. So, you know, that the water was a, is, up, is everywhere. Um, I ended up burying four dogs with huge tumors on their side and inside, you know, so the, the, even the, the animals were affected on this. I tried 30 years ago to stop these people down at the end of the road. I got in front of the truck, made them stop. We got into an argument. The police came up and said, Mr. Harrington, you got to move. Everything's been cleared, saying that it, there wasn't any harm going to come to anybody. So, you know, that was 30 years ago. I stepped out of the way and, and uh, didn't say anything, you know, after that. Um, they did the damage, not me. You know what I mean? It, it's, a, it's a situation where it's frustrating where somebody made a profit out of this and now other people are, are um, you know, reaping the, not reaping the benefits on it, but are getting, you know, sick through it. I say, please pass the bill, you know, because they sh it's the rich taking advantage of the poor. They knew what was going on. I mean, it, it was a situation of, you know, somebody just covering it up and lying to us about it. So I beg you folks there to, to look at this and, and go with the vote on that. You know, do the right things because we know you folks have our back, and uh, that's what we need. Thank I want to. Thank you. If you uh, could wrap it up, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank you, folks, for listening on this, and, and uh, good luck with the decision. I know it's a big thing, and it's very important to us up here. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Harrington. And it's, it is so important for us to hear from um, our constituents, the people who are really affected. Yeah. By, by issues like this. So I appreciate your taking the time and coming on this format, which it can be less than comfortable at times. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your words. And just stick around. There may be a question uh, from a committee member for you. I see Representative Evangelos. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Harrington. Um, uh, I'm sorry for what you're enduring. Um, it's difficult. Um, could you just um, like me, when you mentioned 30 years ago, when you went and tried to stop them, what, what was the activity? Was it people applying chemical fertilizers or something? Just I just wanted to know what the original sourcing was. Well, it was big trucks coming up and, um, you know, they stunk. They just totally stunk. And we saw up in the fields there that there was still toilet paper and urine running out of the piles that they're dumping. And it all ran down the hill. I mean, you could actually see the urine running down the hill. So it, that's what disgusted us at first. And that's why I got in front of the trucks and stopped them. Um, but it came to a point where they said everything was all treated and it wasn't supposed to be harmful. So I believed them on that, you know, and, uh, and went on my business. I mean, 30 years ago, you know, when the police came up there, it was more or less Mr. Harrington, why don't you just move on there and not cause any problem on that? So as for getting it logged down anywhere, you know, things have changed over the years. It would have been logged down right now if I had caused a problem like that. But it was the trucks there that was hauling it up, you know, was drooling out of the trucks. It was disgusting, smelling. And uh, I had three young boys at the time. 
So this was this was refuse from uh, municipal treatment plants and the like. Yes. Okay. okay. From from the waterable plant. I don't know if they call it Pennebecca, but it was the uh, open water bill, the treatment plant. Alrighty. Thank you for that. Thank you, Representative Evangelos. And again, thank you very much, Mr. Harrington, uh, well. for being here today. Uh, the next person I have uh, on my list to testify might be standing right next to you. Uh, <laughs> and that is Catherine Harrington. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, ma'am. And uh, uh, please begin your testimony. And I will put you on the three minute timer as well. Thank you. Thank Good morning you. to all of you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to hear all this. Um, in 85, we had a house built. We raised our three kids and like you said, 14 grandkids all live in the neighborhood and I hear often. Um, we've been active in the community, uh, football. Uh, I'm a youth leader at our church. It has 50 teens. I mean, we have ties to this community and plan to be here forever. But we paid off a mortgage three years ago and we look forward to retirement, either using this house here to live in until we die or uh, to use it for retirement if we want to be snowbirds. Uh, and the children have been, the grandkids have been here, the children have been here all this time. I'm an avid gardener. Each year I have a huge garden. I can, I freeze, I make a wicked good salsa that I give for presents and all that sort of thing. Um, last uh, few years ago, I planted 16 high bush blueberries plants that are supposed to get six feet by six feet. I planted um, uh, apple, berry, uh, elderberry, pear trees, uh, a peach tree. Um, and now I find out it is all poison. We cannot eat any of this, all the berries that we ate last year. Um, so every bit of the land and every bit of my labor is now poison. Um, we had no idea. We have an 18 foot by four foot, four foot pool, which is filled with us and our grandkids every summer that was filled with our well. So they've been swimming in these PFAS chemicals without us knowing all this time. Um, the stress is incredible. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, stop. Okay, so anyways, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia soon after they started dumping. And I've lived with um, migraines and pain all these years. Thought, oh, wow, you know, okay, fibro, who knows where it comes from, whatever. Okay, there's been poison in my water and poison in my food all these years. I wonder where it came from, you know? And it's just not right. It's not right that, that they can do that to just dump in our back field, you know? And uh, it's just, we need, we need some power here. We didn't know what they were doing back then. We tried, we tried to stop them. And they said, no, sir, you've been treated with chemicals. It's been safe, you're fine. And that's all they told us. So our power was taken away, our house, our retirement, everything was taken away and it's nothing that we did. So we need to have this time to be able to get some sort of recourse from this. Otherwise than that, it's just like, where's the fairness in it right <laughs> so um yep so that's about all i have on that and uh i thank you for listening and i i hope that you will vote this through thank you thank you very much uh, ms harrington and you were right on the nose with three minutes so yeah. oh awesome <laughs> thank you and i know this is these are difficult stories to tell and i and i very much appreciate you being here today and sharing your experience yes apologize for the emotions uh, thought i thought i practiced them out <laughs> as well. Are there questions from committee members for Ms. Harrington? Thank you again for being here today. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us. And same to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and the next uh, person I have on my list is Fred Stone. Can Mr. Stone be promoted? I'm not sure I'm seeing Mr. Stone in the attendee room. So at this point, I would ask the committee clerk uh, to be on the lookout for Mr. Stone uh, and promote uh, Mr. Irving. Is 
is Hello. Harry. Yes, Harry uh, Irving. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Am I uh, am I on? Okay. You are on okay, and and I'm going to start a three minute timer. But welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Great. And, uh, welcome. I'd like to say good morning to the committee and thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of going forward with LD363 and 627. I lived at the 71 Howe Road in Fairfield, Maine from 1997 to 216. We discovered this beautiful piece of property. Little did we know what we would learn of what we lived on. I recently found out that our well tested for 19,000 parts. We also raised three daughters there. And it's become very stressful, as Mrs. Harrington said. Sorry about that. That we're frightened of what the future holds, what we've gone through already. We've learned that we may have no recourse. We're having grandchildren now. As Mrs. Harrington said, we farmed on that land. We ate chickens, we ate eggs, we drank the water. We don't know what the future holds. I urge the committee to go forward with this legislation. It is very much needed so that I can protect my family and that other citizens of Maine can be protected from these chemicals that are forever. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Irving, Mr. McKinney. I greatly appreciate you being here and sharing um, that personal story with us. Are there questions from the committee members for Mr. Irving? I believe the dog might want to testify, Mr. Irving. Yeah, yeah, he gets excited too. Okay, uh, I see no questions. So I thank you very much again for coming to the Judiciary Committee. We really appreciate your time and input. Thanks. And I am going to take some things out of order because I received a message that Fred Stone might be with Susan Fonts um, and she has been uh, promoted to a panelist. And is that Mr. Stone? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, welcome. I remember seeing you from last year or when we uh, had this matter in front of us, and I greatly appreciate you being here today. Welcome to the Judi Judi Judiciary Committee, and you can begin your testimony, and I'll start the clock. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and your uh, and the committee's um, um, attention to this to this very important detail. My name is Fred Stone, along with my wife Laura. We own and operate Stone Ridge Farm Inc. It was uh, Stone Ridge Farm Inc. was founded by my grandfather Shirley B. Stone in 1914. It was then uh, passed on to his son Merle e. Stone, and then my wife and I purchased a farm in 1977. And uh, we've always been a dairy operation. We keep registered Brown, Swiss, and Holsteins. Customarily, we milk somewhere around 60 um, head of registered Brown, Swiss, a little lot of uh, in Swiss, and Holsteins, along with another 60 head of uh, young stock. Our nightmare actually began on November 3rd of 2016 when we received a letter from Candy Bunk Water stating that the water that they were pumping out of our aquifer was contaminated with this poison, I guess if you want to call it that, or we can call it a chemical, whichever you like prefer. <clears throat> At that time, our little management team got uh, immediately together to figure out what the hell we were going to do. We had two choices. Either one, we could notify the state that there was a problem and notify Oakhurst, or we could actually keep our mouth shut, which a lot of people told us that we probably should have done, but we've chose not to do that. Uh, the state then came out, tested the water. They said it was fine. Oakhurst ran milk, uh, milk sample and it came back as 1400. That would have been on the, first, the second week of December of that same year. Our little team, because we were suspended immediately, our little team got together again with our lender, John um, Bennett, and um, to see if we what the hell we were going to do. At that time, we were trying to salvage the dairy operation to the point where we spent another $150,000. Yes, that's $150,000 into trying to rectify the situation. DEP in their infinite wisdom came out and did uh, uh, grid testing on the fields and then determined that the source of the contamination was sludge spreading that we had done from 1983 
until 2004, which began with uh, getting sludge from uh, SD Warren at that time, now it's Sappy Paper. And then we moved on to Caney Bunk Sewer District, and then we ended up with a Gunkwit Sewer District in 04. We also did a lot of custom spreading for other dairy farms in that uh, whole area um, and other farms in that whole area. And during that 21 years, we never received any citations or any, uh, any uh, not even a parking ticket from DEP. So everything was done by the book. In fact, we even used a letter stating that fact. <clears throat> I might add that during this whole period of time, we spent another $21,000 in the water filtration system, which comes with a $5,000 a year maintenance fee of which nobody has helped us with these costs, by the way, neither the Department of Agriculture or DEP or anybody else. Even, uh, even USDA has kind of shook their hands at this thing. <clears throat> and moving right along, um, we really worked like a son of a gun to keep this operation intact. In we were uh, choiced with, uh, when we asked DEP and Department of Ag and USDA what the hell they were going to do about this situation, we were told, DEP told us that, well, we spent $35,000 doing testing there, so I guess you're probably much, pretty much on your own to figure it out for yourself, which was really Mr. kind of interesting, I thought. And anyway, we kept on going. We managed Mr. to get our cows after purchasing cows, purchasing feed, and then we ran into a secondary contamination thing, so anyway... Our whole nightmare ended up again in March of, um, of 19, and then it would just become untenable. And that was when I guess we really kicked the beehive okay. over because that's when we went public with this whole mess. And again, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna uh, have we've to had very little help from up. any of these agencies. We've gotten a lot of promises, of course, where we get, always get promises that they're gonna help us, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that, they're gonna do something else and nothing actually happens. And we did manage to try to tell people that there was an issue here going on. And then we were got told that, well, this is a one-off thing, never happened anywhere else when they knew damn well that there was. M so Stone, I guess I, I am just a little bit upset and probably I'm more upset than I was back uh, in July when I spoke with you with Henry Ingerson. We've broken our spirit, you've broken our hearts, and now you've blown up our farm. What are we gonna do with this damn place? The thing is the cattle are worthless, the, the uh, land is worthless. In fact, back when this whole thing started, a Department of Ag decided that they thought it might be a good idea if we went down and exterminate the herd. There was about 120 head in that situation. I told Tanya Thompson that if they, was, if they, they wanted to shoot the whole herd, then, then they can uh, be more than happy to do that. I'll go down, I'll put on my dress whites, uh, and we will uh, shoot the herd, and I'll take the first bullet. Thank you. Week later, Mr. I got a letter from the state on suicide prevention. So if I'm just a little bit upset, that's probably a good reason why we are. So what are we supposed to do? Department of Ag doesn't want to do anything about it. DEP sure as hell doesn't want to do anything about it. And USDA just want to shake their hand up and say, well, you know, the solution for pollution is dilution. Well, I have very serious concerns about that. And in fact, the Department of Ag even mentioned that back in uh, the middle of the summer. Mr. Stone, I don't know if you can hear me. I apologize. We've had to mute. Mr. Stone, can you hear me? Uh. Uh, could uh, Supi, could you please reactivate that microphone? I'm sorry. Mr. Stone, I'm not sure if you were able to hear me during that time. Um, we were trying to abide by a three minute limit. I apologize. I, I said I have Parkinson's, and it's kind of bothersome. So, yes. I, I, th thank you. Um, I would ask if there are any questions. First of all, thank you very much for your testimony uh, and, and coming to share that with us today. I know that's a very difficult topic to discuss. Are there questions from the committee for Mr. Stone? Seeing none, I wanna thank you very much for your, your testimony, sir, and uh, for taking the time to come and speak with us today. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, and it's my understanding uh, from notes that I am receiving that Marilyn Tozier might be at this location as well. Is that accurate? If it is not, I will then move to the next uh, persons on my list of people signed up to testify in favor. And we will go to Julie Marie Bickford, then Michelle Pelletier, and then Scott 
chamber. Ms. Bickford, if you unmute your microphone and turn on your video, uh, it would be your opportunity to testify. Ms. Bickford, can you please unmute your microphone? Is the committee clerk able to unmute Ms. Bickford's microphone? Okay, I will, Ms. Bickford? Yes, hello. Thank, Thank you, Representative Hartnett and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Julie Marie Bickford. I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Dairy Industry Association. Um, MDIA represents all of the dairy farms that are shipping over 70 million gallons of fresh quality milk each year. And it's bottled in one of our four major fluid bottling plants in the state. Our dairy farm families consider food safety and cleanliness of the animals and soils that produce our food to be of the utmost importance. Maine dairy farms also have the unfortunate distinction of being among the first in the nation to deal with the appearance and impacts of the PFOS and PFOA chemicals. Beginning in the late 1980s, dairy farmers were encouraged to spread municipal sludge on their fields. This was considered cutting edge green science to enrich the soils while simultaneously dealing with waste products that would otherwise plug our landfills and be a pollutant risk to our waterways. Science is constantly evolving and by the late 2000s, fewer and fewer dairy farms were accepting these materials on, these far on the farmland. As education and research has progressed to understand these contaminants found within the sludge, which came from a variety of consumer and industrial sources, we're now having to deal with the consequences of what was at one time considered a safe disposal option. We strongly support using the best available scientific information to make policy decisions and have appreciated that use so far from our state departments and officials. But the farms that have discovered this contamination are now facing significant health, environmental, and financial injuries and challenges. The farms are not at fault for this contamination and have been injured by the appearance of these chemicals, as have the individual homeowners. Maine's dairy industry is doing everything within our power to deal with remediation and identify a path forward for our farm businesses and families, but we need assistance and the entities who are helping us need appropriate resources to render such aid. The families who run the farms also live on them and earn their living from the farm. Their daily mission is to produce safe food to feed their neighbors. This bill is a tool to help protect the farms from once again becoming harmed as an unintended consequence of an outdated liability law that fails to offer them any recourse in this unfortunate situation that we find ourselves facing. I thank you for your time today and I'd be glad to answer any questions now or at the work session. Thank you very much, Ms. Bickford, for being here and providing that testimony uh, today and for all the work you do for the dairy industry. Are there questions for Ms. Bickford from, the, from committee members? Representative Babbage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bickford, thanks for being with us. Um, I, ju I just wanted to ask you about uh, your membership, uh, the dairy industry in Maine. Can you give me an idea of its geographic uh, reach here in the state? Sure, we have farms. Uh, we have a farm in Kittery. We have farms in Cornish in York County. We go all the way up through um, the Bethel area up into uh, Farmington stretching all the way through in every county in the state with the exception of Hancock County. And the only reason Hancock is exempted, they have dairies, but they're very small goat and sheep dairies and they're not shipping commercially. But our 194 farmers are spread throughout the state 
up in Arista County, Washington, all around. Um, and so we, um, we do have some concentrated areas that we call the Dairy Belt that runs through the central part of the state. Uh, but, you know, we are distributed. Uh, we're, we're kind of a, a hidden powerhouse industry scattered throughout the state. And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, can you give us an idea? I mean, I, I realize that uh, sewage treatment plant themselves were, you know, a, a green response, uh, late 60s, early 70s, especially in the early 70s, uh, implemented around the state. And uh, I recall when, when uh, the sludge was, uh, you know, treated, uh, the, the organic treatment of that doesn't, never, never anticipated uh, forever chemicals like Teflon and so forth being uh, part of uh, this problem. What is the uh, incidence rate, would you say, of Maine's dairy farms uh, use of uh, waste sludge? I think, I, I don't have exact numbers or percentages. Of course, our number of dairy farmers has changed dramatically over the years. The amount of dairy land in use has remained fairly constant. Um, so, but not everybody chose to take on the additional municipal sludge on their land base. Um, it was, uh, so dairy farmers have to deal with the own, their own waste that's generated by their animals. And you have uh, limits on how much you can spread per acre per square foot. Um, and so you, you need to have enough land base in order to accommodate that and to accommodate taking on additional. Um, and so, you know, that, that starts shrinking the pool. And then there were some people who were just not at all interested in taking this on. But, um, you know, we, we, I, I hate to say, say that, you know, it's more ubiquitous than what we've identified so far, but um, I think, you know, it's very likely based on the nature of these chemicals and how they have, um, how they have persisted, especially as identified through the waste streams that uh, it's possible. Thank you. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Babich. Are there other questions for Ms. Bickford? Seeing none, thank you again for uh, presenting testimony to our committee today. We very much appreciate you taking the time uh, to inform us. Thank you. The next individual testifying in favor will be Scott Faber, followed by Susan Fonts. Mr. Faber. Thank you, Chair Hartnett uh, and, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of LD363 and LD627. Uh, my name is Scott Faber and I'm an adjunct professor at, at Georgetown University Law Center. And I also uh, work for the Environmental Working Group, which has uh, been trying to address the risks posed by PFAS for several decades. Today, I'm, I'm testifying on my own behalf. Um, my view is that fairness dictates that individuals and property owners who were just simply unaware of their exposure to PFAS should be permitted to seek civil remedies after the harm has been discovered. And uh, Maine has been a real leader on these issues. Uh, you know that all of us are being exposed to PFAS every day, uh, but few, uh, few ordinary uh, Mainers and other Americans understand all the ways that we may be exposed to PFAS. Um, many of us know it may be in our water. Some of us know it may be in our food due to contaminated biosolids or because of uh, the use of PFAS in food packaging. Uh, I, I doubt uh, many of us know that PFAS is used in our cosmetics to make our eyeliners waterproof or to make our razors glide or that PFAS is used in our sunscreens or even in our dental floss. Um, and like consumers, Landowners like Mr. and Mrs. Harrington or Mr. Stone um, were, were, were unaware that their property may have been impacted by these forever chemicals. Uh, PFAS releases into the air and water 
from nearby manufacturers still don't have to be reported. Uh, and so there's no way of knowing whether or not your land has been uh, impacted by a, near, uh, a nearby manufacturer. Until very recently, um, uh, states did not require manufacturers or utilities to test for biosolids, test biosolids for the presence of PFAS uh, or to report their results. Uh, Maine is one of, a re one of the real leaders in this regard. Um, and, uh, but toxic tort law by and large has, has long recognized that statutes of limitation should be modified to accommodate the, the sorts of injuries that we're talking about uh, today, the sorts of injuries caused by toxic chemicals like PFAS, uh, including property damages. And, and unlike Maine, as you've heard, most states have adopted discovery rules that permit civil remedies when uh, individuals or property owners were unaware that they're uh, of their exposure to a, P, a pollutant like PFAS, and in particular, other New England states also have created uh, legislative or judicial discovery rules to accommodate these sorts of toxic injuries to property. And, and just one example, Ca uh, Connecticut um, has adopted exceptions from their state statutes of limitations to apply to risks similar to those to be cons considered uh, by you today. Uh, many other states have adopted similar discovery rules ranging from Alaska to Wyoming and Alabama where thousands of acres of farmland have been contaminated also have adopted similar, similar discovery rules. To, to wrap up, let me just say that um, uh, it's very important that farmers and other landowners have the opportunity to seek justice for these, these harms and I really appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and taking the time out to join us today. Are there any questions from the committee for Professor Faber? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate your input. Take care. The next person on my list is Susan Fonts. Ms. Fonts, if you could uh, unmute yourself and activate your video. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I apologize for the technological issues. I'm in a conference room with both the Tozers and Fred Stone. Um, and I'm not sure if Marilyn Tozer was called yet, but she is here with me um, and she'll be listed under my name. <laughs> I'm here uh, because uh, I am uh, representing both uh, Marilyn and Frank Tozer and also Fred Stone um, for PFAS contamination on their farm. Um, as has already been said, Maine uh, is somewhat an outlier as compared to other states in that we do not have an explicit discovery rule in terms of the statute of limitations as it applies to property damage um, for civil cases. Um, as has already been said, um, there's 37 other states um, which allow a discovery rule for um, contamination and some of those uh, states actually um, define contamination as much broader than PFAS. What we're asking for here today is a limited exception um, with regard to PFAS specifically um, to allow for an explicit discovery rule in order to allow those farmers and those individual homeowners who have been contaminated to pursue a civil case against the manufacturers of these chemicals. Um, it's the only fair thing to do. The manufacturers of these chemicals knew the dangers of these chemicals. They kept those dangers a secret. Um, and when uh, farmers like the Tozers and Fred Stone were spreading sludge uh, on their property as sanctioned uh, by the state, uh, by permits, uh, they had no idea uh, that these chemicals were, were a problem. Additionally, a discovery rule um, will shift uh, costs to the private sector as opposed to taxpayers. Um, we need, you know, people's homes that have been contaminated, farms that have been contaminated, they need to install remediation systems, they need monitoring. Um, and right now, no one is paying for that. Um, and instead of making the taxpayers pay for something um, for this, um, we should allow civil remedies to allow private sector to pay for that. Uh, additionally, last time that I testified before this committee last July, there was a lot of questions about municipalities um, and districts being sued uh, in terms of this bill. Um, I addressed those questions last time by explaining that there is the Maine Tort Claims Act, 
um, which only allows a person to pursue a claim against a state uh, entity or a municipality or quasi municipality uh, based on limited exceptions. Uh, our reading of that law is that the Main Tort Claims Act would still apply. Um, there, there wouldn't, this would not open up the floodgate to pursue litigation against municipalities. And in fact, this would give municipalities um, an option to be able to bring forth a claim against the private sector should they feel necessary if their district has been particularly harmed. For all of those reasons today, I, I just urge this committee to pass this bill. I know we did this last year in July. Um, I'm hoping that we will do this this time around and it will go to the floor uh, and be voted in favor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Fonts. We appreciate your testimony today. Are there questions from committee members for Ms. Fonts? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Fonts, am I correct that Marilyn Tozier is with you? Yes. Then I will uh, take her testimony in favor of uh, the legislation. Okay, great. At this, at this time. And I will be welcome, uh, Ms. Tozier. I will begin the clock uh, when you start to speak and let you know when the three minutes is up. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Marilyn Tozier. I am here on behalf of our family farm to testify in support of LD 363 and LD 627. Tozier's Dairy is a 10th generation farm run in Fairfield, Maine. Farming has always been our way of life, supporting ourselves from the sale of milk and beef. We have over 500 acres of land that we use to plant and harvest corn. We feed approximately 300 cattle. Last summer, all of this changed when we were notified by the DEP that our milk was contaminated with chemical we had never heard of, PFAS. We were forced to immediately stop selling our milk and beef. DEP has since conducted testing on our cows, milk, and land. As you may have heard, they have also tested numbers of other Fairfield properties and have discovered PFAS contamination in land and wells. We have been told that the PFAS was due to sludge that was spread on our land decades ago, dating back to the 1980s. At the time when the sludge was spread, we had no idea what PFAS was and certainly did not know about the dangers of the chemicals. Farmers from across the state were sought out to participate in the sludge programs, which offered it as free fertilizer that was good for the land and would help all those involved. We first learned that the sludge may have contained PFAS and about the hazards when the DEP contacted us last summer. We now know that these chemicals are harmful to our own families, our neighbors, livestock, and the entire ecosystem. Even though the loss of selling milk and beef has resulted in no income to the farm, we continue to feed and care for the animals as well as maintain the properties. Nearly a year later, we have not received any state or federal assistance. On behalf of my family and our farm, I urge the committee to pass this bill. The bill would allow farmers like my family to pursue several remedies from the time the contamination is discovered instead of the time the contamination happened. We need this bill. Please help with our desperate situation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Tozier, we greatly appreciate you coming down today or coming electronically to us to share your story uh, and your farm story. Are there questions from the committee for Ms. Tozier? Seeing none, again, the committee thanks you very much for taking the time to share um, your observations with us today. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on my list is Ashley Goldrup followed by Kelly Barnes and Kelly Rogers. Ms. Goldrup. Ms. Goldrup just disappeared from my list. I will, oh, Ms. Goldrup, if you could uh, unmute your microphone and start your video. Hello, I'm Ashley Goldrup. Thank you and welcome to uh, the Judiciary Committee. 
I am having a hard time hearing on my phone. Let me just... Can you guys hear me still? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so good morning uh, to everybody, uh, Senator Carney, Representative uh, Harnett, and uh, the members of the Judici Judiciary Committee. I'm Ashley Goldrup, and I live at 25 Howe Road in Fairfield with my fiance, Troy. We're members of the community group Fairfield Water Concerned Citizens, and I'm here to testify in support of the LD 363 and 627. We bought our first home on six lovely acres of open field with breathtaking views just a little over a year ago. When we bought this home, we thought that this was the dream home that we had been searching for. This was going to be the property that we got married on, grow Lush's gardens on, and host family gatherings at, and maybe even start a family. Well, that quickly changed back in November uh, when the DEP contacted us to state that they needed to come test our well for the forever chemicals. Even after they called, uh, we tried to stay positive, thinking that since we're high up on a hill or that our well is pretty deep, that maybe we would be okay and not, not contaminated. A few weeks after that, um, we got a call from Molly stating that we, uh, she wanted to personally call us to tell us that we needed to stop drinking our water because our numbers were um, over 20,000 parts per trillion. Keep in mind that 70 parts per trillion is the safe limit. Um, this was the most devastating news that we could get as, the fir as first time homeowners. Uh, you know, we feel like we should be enjoying our beautiful new home, not worrying about the, this contamination. Uh, so this means that the whole year that we were here um, prepping our food, cooking, drinking it, giving it to our animals. We have a hot tub, so we were, we were soaking in it, watering our gardens and, you know, our little nieces and nephews running through sprinklers. Um, we had no idea that we were being, you know, we were exposing them to contaminated water and land. Um, it's not just the water, you know, that's contaminated. It's your soil, it's your dust, it's your air due to the spreading of the sludge as well. So that makes it scary. Um, and trying to enjoy a hot shower or even a cold cup of water or my beautiful new home, is, it's really hard knowing that it could be killing us. So we're asking you to uh, pass the bills out of this committee with a recommendation that is passed by the legislator. Uh, this bill would be helpful to clarify the statute of limitations on this matter. It would be unfair to allow polluters to escape the liability of their damages to other people's property when in our case there was no reason for us to suspect and uh, no way that to, that we have known that we were contaminated. Um, had we known our property was contaminated we wouldn't have even considered purchasing, purchasing it. So we feel that our lives and our largest investment that we've ever been ever made is being jeopardized by the wrongful acts of the corporate wrongdoers. Um, they should not be allowed to avoid responsibility simply by keeping uh, their pollution a secret. Um, we feel that we have the right to live on land that is clean, drink water that is clean, and to be able to have our family over at our new dream home and not have to be worrying that we're uh, exposing them to contamination or harm. Um, I would just like to, you know, say how would how would you feel if it was you living on this land, you know, having your family over for dinner and unknowingly preparing their food on on uh, contaminated land and water. Uh, we feel, I feel that, you know, it, it's upsetting, it's scary, and we're just asking for, asking for help. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Ms. Goldruff, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, share your story with the committee. I know this is, can be difficult to do. Uh, are there any questions from committee members for Ms. Goldruff? Seeing none, um, Thank you very much. Uh, I hope there's something we can do to help. The next person on my list is Kelly Barnes, followed by Kelly Rogers, and then Lawrence Higgins. Kelly Barnes, if you could unmute your microphone and activate your video, that would be great. Kelly Barnes, can you hear me? Uh, while we wait for Kelly Barnes, I will turn to Kelly Rogers. Hi there, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I'm gonna start the clock when you, uh, after I uh, welcome you to the Judiciary Committee. 
um, and please present your, your testimony on these bills. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and all Judiciary Committee members for giving us your time. Uh, again, my name is Kelly Rogers and I support the LD363 and 627 bill. Um, my wife and I have lived at 68 Nice Corner Drive since August of 2000, just over 20 years with our son who is now an adult with his own kids. They do not live with us at this current time, but they're at our house all the time. Um, as well, my, my elderly mother moved in with us in 2007. Um, in September 1st, 2020, we made our last mortgage payment, a very exciting time in our lives. However, on October 22nd, 2020, one month later, a little over one month, um, we got a letter from the DEP that our water may be contaminated with forever chemicals. You cannot imagine how distraught we were. Our water was tested on November 17th, 2021. And again, on, dis uh, sorry, 11-17, uh, 2020. And again, 12-3, 2020. Um, they have put filtration systems in them. We're waiting to see if that is currently going to work. Our levels are 123 parts per trillion, which is not as high as others, but it's still over the 70. Um, but that also doesn't include the other high PFAs in my water with the long chain and short chains of PFs in the water. My taxes have tripled since the year 2000. Now, what is my house worth? Who would purchase it with contaminated soil and water? So now I am only drinking water that is a little contaminated. How is this safe or healthy? We can't drink the water, brush our teeth, cook with it. What about our health? We have two dogs that died five days apart of unexplained bleeding with tumors in 2014. My wife developed breast cancer June 1st, 2019. She also has thyroid disease. My mother came to live with us to be safe, was diagnosed with bladder cancer in September of 2015. And in July of 2019 with blood abnormalities as she's bleeding internally. What is next? How are we going to know how serious this has medically affected us, not to mention the emotional toil it has taken on us? We have a garden that we have had for six or seven years using our contaminated water. We have a five and a half year old grandchild and a three year old grandchild who we fill our wading pool with, with that water. They drank the water in the pool as all little kids do. Um, my son and daughter-in-law lived with us while my daughter-in-law was pregnant with my grandson. He had a low birth weight. He also spent the first two years in the NICU in Portland. Something needs to be done. People knew these chemicals were bad and gave them to the farms. These polluters need to pay for damages, not us taxpayers. I support the LD363 and 627, and I urge you to as well. So the courts of the state help us to seek ju justice. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much for, for your testimony today um, and, and for sharing that experience with us. Are there questions from committee members for Kelly Rogers? Seeing none, uh, again, I do want to ex express my thanks for uh, having you join us today. I know this is very difficult. I I'm going to try one more time for Kelly Barnes. If Kelly Barnes can hear me, if you could unmute your mic, you will have an opportunity to testify. Can you hear me? Uh, I I'm going to get to you in a second, Mr. Higgins. I was trying to... Uh, See if we could rescue Kelly Barnes. Oh, I'm sorry. But that's okay. This is a new world. Uh, Mr. Higgins, welcome uh, to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we appreciate you coming to testify today. Um, please begin your testimony. I'm going to start the three minute clock when you do. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Hanna and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Lawrence Higgins, and I live here in Fairfield with my wife Penny. And I'm one of the leaders of the community group Fairfield Water Concerned Citizens. We're up over 260 members right now. Uh, we've lived here for 28 years, raising our kids and grandchildren. We built a barn for alpacas, a mini horse, mule, donkey, and a pony. 
And we've always had chickens to supply, supply our whole family and neighbors with eggs, which now we're told are full of PFAS contamination from the water and the soil. Which that is why I'm testifying to support the LD363 and the 627. Last October, the DEP called us saying that they tested our water and it was contaminated from the sludge spread across the road from my house. Um, I got off my list, I'm sorry. Uh, we've worked here for our whole life, raising our family, providing them with, and trying to do our best to protect them from every way possible. Now we find out that all of us, including our animals, have been poisoned by these PFAS contaminations in our water, our soil, that the state of Maine allowed and promoted the farmers to spread. And I don't blame the farmers, I'm blaming the state. More tests need to be done across the state. Maine deserves to know if our water and soil are contaminated with these forever chemicals. And they also deserve to have legal recourse, even if a contamination happened over six years ago. We deserve to be able to file a lawsuit six years after discovery of a contamination. This is an opportunity for us to receive justice and to make polluters pay. I am pissed off to think that the state of Maine is willing to stick their head in the sand and allow Maine residents to get poisoned. They are not willing to even spend the money to purchase the equipment and license people to test our water for these chemicals. They claim it's too expensive. How much is a person's life worth? How the hell can you sit there and allow this to happen to every, the same people that elected you into office? Maine's current drinking water guideline for these chemicals is 70 parts per trillion, one of the highest PFAS allowable limits in New England. We have friends in Fairfield that have almost 30,000 parts per trillion in their water. What the hell's going on? I took an oath when I got into the planning board member, and I'm sure most of you did too, to improve and enhance the quality of life of the residents and visitors of Maine. I thought Maine was a place to raise your family, live off the land, and earn an honest living. It's time to stand up and show the world that you really do care about your Maine residents. Be a leader, not a follower. Put safety over, over profit. Make every Maine lab test for these PFAS chemicals. There's not a licensed lab in Maine right now that has a, this can test for these. We have to send it out of state to get them tested. That's pathetic. Uh, Mr. Higgins, I'm going to have to ask you to, to, to wrap it up, sir. I appreciate it. Please support Maine in passing these LD363 and 627 bills and take real action to address this contamination crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Higgins, and for your advocacy on behalf of uh, your community and your community members. Appreciate it. Are there questions for Mr. Higgins from any committee members? Seeing none, I thank you again uh, for, for your testimony and hope that we can help out. The next, I uh, have two other people listed to testify in favor, the next being Nathan Saunders and then Troy Rennie. Mr. Saunders. Can you hear me okay? can hear you just fine, sir. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. And uh, we will listen to your testimony and I will set the three minute clock when you begin to speak, sir. Good morning, Representative Harnett and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My testimony is less than four minutes in length and I hope you will allow me that time. My name is Nathan Saunders and my wife and I have lived at 30 Howe Road in Fairfield, Maine for 33 years, raising three sons during that time. In a letter from the DEP dated February 18th of this year, I was informed that our drinking water has a combined PFOA and PFOS level of 12,910 parts per trillion. This is 184 times the federal health advisory of 70 parts per trillion. 
One way to look at this is that if the federal health advisory tells me I can take only one pill of PFAS per day to be safe, I have just learned that I have been taking 184 pills of PFAS per day of this man-made hazardous substance for many years and not of my own free will. On the other side of the street from our home are many acres of cornfields where spreading of some material, I thought it was just manure, has occurred for many years and according to the DEP, it was stopped in 2003. In 2010, seven years later, my wife's kidneys failed. To keep her alive, she went on kidney dialysis for three hours per day, three times a week, eight months, until we were fortunate enough that I was able to donate a kidney to her. Although the kidney transplant was life-saving, this event has been a life-changing and very challenging to my wife and me, and has had a significant impact on our whole family. According to the Federal Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry, in a study regarding kidney effects, the report says, quote, several epidemiological studies on occupational, general, and community populations report an association between the exposure to PFAS and reduced kidney function. I am stunned to recently find out that PFAS contamination is likely the reason for our challenging health experiences over the last 11 years. The question I have, which is troubling, is was sludge spreading near my home stopped in 2003 because there was knowledge that the sludge contained a harmful chemical? This is yet to be determined, but it is clear now that it could have been life-changing if someone had tested our well and other wells in the community in 2003 to make sure that the citizens that supported these industries where PFAS may have been used were not being contaminated with a hazardous chemical that clearly an industrial entity brought into the community. If someone knew about this hazardous land contamination in 2003, then someone or some entity did not treat their fellow men right. Someone was making money at the expense of the common hardworking people of Maine. In conclusion, I urge the committee to pass LD 363 and 627 so that my family and many other families in the state of Maine have the opportunity to discover the truth about what caused PFAS contamination in Maine. And so that affected people are not silenced by a Maine statute of limitations that would unreasonably favor business profits and not allow the citizens of Maine to have the due process of law. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Saunders. We appreciate hearing your input and testimony on these bills. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Saunders from members of the committee? Seeing none, I thank you again, sir, for taking the time out. Um, thank you very much. Talk with us today. The, the next person that uh, I have, and it's the last person I have who signed up to testify in favor is Troy Rennie. Um, Troy, if you operate your mic, uh, thank you, unmute your mic and your video if you can. Um, Yep. Can you guys hear me? Here you fine. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. I'm going to start the uh, three minute clock when uh, you begin to testify, sir. All righty. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Troy Rainey, and I live at 25 Howe Road in Fairfield with my fiance, Ashley Gouldrup. Uh, we are members of the community group Fairfield Water Concerned Citizens. And I'm here to testify in support of LD363 and LD627. And to start off, uh, we bought our home on the Howe Road roughly a year ago for $243,000 and an annual tax of roughly $4,600 a year, making that a monthly payment of roughly $1,800 a month with taxes being included. So around September, of last year, one of my neighbors asked me if I had heard anything about the PFAS contamination in the milk in the dairy farm down the road from us. I said I had. He then told me about Molly King at the DEP and gave me a number to call, and so I did. The first call, she said that we were way out of the contamination zone, so they wouldn't be testing our road. Three weeks later, Molly called and said the zone had expanded to my road and they would like to test my water. A few weeks after the test was drawn, Molly called and wanted to personally alert us of the extremely high levels of PFAS in our water. Roughly 20,000 parts per trillions 
combined between PFAS and PFOS, with the safe limit being 70. This is absolutely devastating news. To think that we invested almost a quarter of a million dollars into a property that is now on contaminated land and the water is highly poisonous. Uh, we, we, uh, we would have never purchased the home knowing this information. And to add to that, who would ever want to pass this uh, property onto their loved ones knowing this information? The property has pretty much been rendered useless to us and we still have to pay top dollar for it. I'm asking the committee to please pass this bill and recommend that it be passed by the legislator. The bill would be very helpful to clarify the statute of limitations on this matter. And it, I think it's very unfair to let the citizens have to deal with the problems that have been caused uh, by higher above the citizens themselves. So I'm just urging you to please pass the bill so we may have justice that we deserve. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Greatly appreciate your testimony and your taking the time to deliver it to us today. Are there members of the committee that have any questions for Mr. Rene? Seeing none, again, I thank you very much for taking the time uh, to share thank your thoughts with us today. And I've just been notified, our electronic system is sometimes tricky. Two people that I thought were signing up, neither for nor against, are actually in favor. So I will turn to them now, the first being Lanny Graham. Ms. Graham, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you could unmute your microphone um, and uh, proceed with oh. your testimony, and I will start the three-minute clock. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Lani Graham. I currently live in Freeport. I am a family practice physician and former chief public health officer for Maine. In 2019, I was also a member of the governor's PFAS task force, and I am here to support these uh, two bills. The story of farms ruined by PFAS contamination has been widely reported, as well as the tragic contamination of wells in Fairfield. And those of us who have studied this issue believe that these appalling stories are likely to be repeated and that other Maine families will experience similar, if not more catastrophic losses. I don't think I can improve on the indeed heartbreaking testimony of, uh, offered by, by Maine people. But as my area of, of, health, of expertise is health, I want to briefly mention the very serious health effects that have already been linked to this family of chemicals, including decreasing the normal responsiveness of the immune system. In this time of COVID, we've become acutely aware of the importance of a well-functioning immune system. And there are other adverse health effects that have been demonstrated in, in humans. Reduced fertility, thyroid disease, increasing cholesterol levels, and the occurrence of several cancers. Unfortunately, it seems that as research goes on, evidence for new serious health effects will increase. This would be typical of most contaminants. We saw it with lead, we saw it with mercury, and we saw it with tobacco. Many farms and even family gardens where sludge was spread have not been tested. As a result, some Maine people may now be drinking water that is unsafe for them or growing vegetables that are contaminated. Unfortunately, testing is expensive, between $250 and $500 for a water test. If you do manage to pay for the test and these chemicals are found, achieving safe levels of drinking water may run into the thousands of dollars. Even now, how Maine will get rid of the contaminated soil and sludge remains a mystery. It's hard to understand why chemicals whose health impacts were unknown, but whose resistance to breakdown earned them nickname, nickname forever, were used so widely. Those responsible for making such unwise decisions should be held accountable. The task force did discuss this issue and a majority of members voted to recommend to the governor that action be taken to change Maine's law so that Maine people might obtain just re redress against those who harm them and perhaps gain the wherewithal to make their own drinking water and homegrown vegetables safe for consumption. 
Thank you for your attention and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Graham. Uh, you were right on the three minute mark. <laughs> You've done this before. Yes. <laughs> um, th thank you very much for sharing um, your knowledge with us today. And I see that we have a question from Representative Babich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Graham, thanks for testifying. As a member of the task force, I wondered if you might be able to tell me if um, I could have asked some of the people uh, prior, but uh, are, the, are the folks who are suffering from contaminated uh, wells and so forth uh, victims of, uh, say, sludge uh, disbursement in, uh, in a, in a uh, close geographic area or have entire aquifers been contaminated? Well, it, as has been said earlier, uh, these chemicals travel widely and with ease through soil. So I don't think we really know fully the answer to your question. Entire aquifers may be contaminated. Um, it's just at this point, not fully known. Thank, thank you, Representative Babich. Are there additional questions for Ms. Graham? Seeing none, uh, again, thank you very much for providing your testimony today. And Representative Babich, if you could lower your hand, that would be great. Uh, and, you know, as we struggle with this technology or work with this technology, I, I failed to mention our committee clerk, Susan Panette, and our committee analyst, Peggy Reinch, who are really the magic behind making all these things actually work. So uh, I wanted to recognize and thank them. The next person and uh, that I have on my list to testify in favor is Sarah Woodbury. Welcome, Ms. Woodbury, uh, to the Judiciary Committee. And you can begin your testimony at any time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Harnett. My apologies for the confusion about the, the in favor of and the neither for nor against thing. I must have hit the wrong button. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Sarah Woodbury. I am the Director of Advocacy for Defend Our Health, formerly known as the Environmental Health Strategy Center. We work to make sure that everyone has equal access to safe drinking water, safe products, healthy homes, toxic-free, climate-friendly products. Um, please accept this testimony in support of both LD 363 and 627. These two bills are essentially a the same bill, the same bill, and they would both allow folks impacted by PFAS contamination the opportunity to seek justice for themselves and their families and to tell their stories in court. Um, we are aware you have heard from Fred Stone, you have heard from the Tozers that their dairy farms and livelihoods have been ruined by PFAS contamination. As a result of st state sanctioned spreading of industrial and municipal sludge, Fred Stone's land is now practically worthless. Current Maine law generally requires people like Fred and Laura Stone to initiate legal action within six years of the occurrence of PFAS pollution on their farm. In Fred and Laura's case, that was well over 30 years ago. Um, yet this is more about more than the Stones and the Tozers. As you have heard, um, as more testing is done, we are finding more and more contaminated farms. Um, the Tozier farm found levels of PFAS in their cow's milk that is likely the highest identified in North America. While the source of the contamination is still being determined, it is almost certain that this farm will experience difficulties obtaining justice without the changes authorized in LD 363 and 627. Additionally, the well owners that you heard from um, have been found to have extremely high levels of PFAS. The number of contaminated wells will continue to grow as DEP continues to test. The list of farmers, homeowners, and others needing a path to justice will only increase over time. Right now, legal doctrine allows the state to take legal action against polluters if the statute of limitations has expired, but regular Mainers cannot. Mainers should not have less rights than the state does when it comes to seeking recourse against chemical companies that have poisoned their land and water. 37 other states, including our neighbors in New Hampshire and Vermont, have discovery laws similar to the bills proposed here. Landowners in Maine should not be left out of legal remedies simply because they live in Maine and not New Hampshire. And as Dr. Graham just mentioned, the governor's PFAS task force recognized this disparity and a majority of the task force members recommended the legislature address this. The cost of PFAS cleanup is immense. The Kennebunk, Kennebunkport and Wells Water District invested at least a million dollars in filters to protect their customers at a, a cost that will likely be passed down to ratepayers. Fred has already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in an attempt to clean up his farm with little success. 
As more contamination is found, more farmers and municipalities will be on the hook for the cost of cleanup. It, is, it should not be up to the farmers or the local communities or the municipalities to pay for cleanup of chemicals that most have never even heard of before. This bill alone will not solve the PFAS crisis. We are under no illusion that we can sue our way out of this problem, but simply put, it is a critical step forward in providing some measure of justice and ensuring Maine families whose livelihoods and health have been destroyed by PFAS at a minimum do not face hurdles higher than those in the majority of other states. So we urge you to pass both of these bills unanimously. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Woodbury. Are there any questions from committee members for Ms. Woodbury? Seeing none, again, I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, provide your testimony today. And I am going to check in with my committee clerk. That is the last of the individuals that I have signed up to testify in favor. I'm going to ask if there's any member in the attendee room that wants to testify in favor of these two pieces of legislation. And I see Heather Spaulding. If Heather could be promoted um, to a panelist, that would be wonderful. Welcome, Ms. Spaulding, and thank you very much for coming before the Judiciary Committee today uh, to testify on these bills. You can begin whenever you are comfortable, and I will start the magic three-minute clock. Okay. Thank you so much, and I apologize, too, for um, not uh, selecting the correct button. Um, good morning, I guess, it, or it's almost noon, but uh, good day, uh, Representative Harnett and members of the Committee on Judiciary. My name is Heather Spaulding. I'm Deputy Director of MOFCA, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. MOFCA is creating a food system that is healthy and fair for all of us. Through education, training, and advocacy, we're helping farmers thrive, making more local organic food available, and building sustainable communities. MOFCA supports this legislation, and we thank Representative Pluker and Representative Perry for introducing the legislation. And we, um, we have members in thousands of homes across the state and all are vulnerable to the impact of PFAS. We're all growing more concerned about how PFAS threatens the health of Maine people as well as Maine's rural economy. As Maine works to gather information about the extent of PFAS contamination, it is essential to turn off the tap, protect the health of Maine citizens and hold the manufacturers manufacturers of these toxic forever chemicals accountable for ever allowing the materials to come to market. As you've heard today, Maine dairy farms are at the center of PFAS challenges in Maine. Dairy farms also are the nexus of our state's agricultural economy and communities. It is imperative that we do everything we can to help these farm businesses succeed. Protecting the health of Maine's dairies and farm, all farmland must be a top priority for our state's leadership. We appreciate the efforts of Maine legislators, Governor Mills and the PFAS Task Force, the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, the Environmental Protection. Senator Susan Collins and Congressman Shelley Pingree also are advocating for decisive action by the USDA and EPA. And all of this should lead to the logical conclusion. Polluters should pay for the mess that they secretly yet intentionally created. At MOFCA, we're working hard to provide helpful information. Uh, we've created a resource page on our website. It's really geared toward farmers, but there's useful, useful information for everyone. Um, and we're also being proactive and collaborating with Maine Farmland Trust in cooperation with the Department of Agriculture to host a Maine PFAS Emergency Relief Fund. Um, we are, are trying. Um, we're very concerned about the information that's coming out every day. Um, but we really feel that this legislation would go a long way to help landowners who, um, whose property and their water has been contaminated through no fault of their own. So really appreciate your consideration of this. We hope that Maine will move forward and join 37 other states that allow cases to proceed on the basis of when pollution was discovered rather than when it first occurred. Let's pass LD 363 and hold polluters legally and financially accountable for the mess they have created. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Spaulding, and uh, we appreciate you being here and taking the time to testify before us today. <laughs> Excuse me, are there questions from any committee members for Ms. Spaulding? 
Seeing none again, thank you very much for your, for your time and participation. To, uh, I'm just gonna peruse the uh, attendee room again to make sure that uh, there's nobody else who wants to testify in favor of these bills. I will then ask if there are any persons who are interested in testifying in opposition to these bills to raise their hand in the attendee room. Seeing none, I will then move to persons testifying neither. Oh, Mr. Blanchett, are you here to testify? Uh, yes, I am. In, in what well, capacity, sir? Neither for nor against. Okay, I have three people signed up in the neither for nor against. Um, and I, why don't I start with you, Mr. Blanchett? Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Um, and begin your testimony anytime, and I will start the three minute timer. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Connie and Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Leonard Blanchett. I am the general manager for the Brunswick Sewer District, and I am testifying on behalf of the Maine Water Environment Association. The Maine Water Environment Association appreciates the opportunity to provide the following testimony, neither for nor against LD363 and LD627. We are, however, concerned about direct and indirect impacts that this legislation would have on municipal wastewater facilities. About Maine Water Environment Association, the Maine Water Environment Association is a nonprofit all volunteer association of over 650 members consisting of municipal and industrial wastewater system operators, consultants, students, and regulatory officials. The mission of MAWIA is to support and enhance Maine's water environment community through promoting training opportunities, supporting balanced environmental policy and practice, and promoting education and collaboration with the public to protect and enhance Maine's water resources. Wastewater and drinking water systems have been unknowingly and unwillingly recipients of the compounds commonly referred to as PFAS. These systems should not be held liable for chemicals over which they have no control. Rather, the manufacturers of the chemicals, as well as the manufacturers of goods containing such chemicals, should bear the burden of the effects these chemicals are having on our environment and public health. While we understand the bills as drafted would allow some protection under the Maine Tort Claims Act, we still have concerns about the cost our customers may face because of this legislation, which may detract from other investments that are important to public health. For example, the liability absorbed by the landfill sites and beneficial reuse contractors who currently receive biosolids from our member systems would require them to institute massive process and management controls that would ultimately lead to large scale increases in our tipping fees or refusal to accept our waste product. This would cause further disruption in our ability to serve our customers beyond the current impacts experienced over the past couple of years that have increased main biosolids management costs by over 30% since the emergence of PFAS concerns. To cover likely further increase, increased fees, wastewater systems will be forced to raise rates or reallocate funds from other important projects that protect our environment. In short, even if water systems are not directly liable under this bill, the impact of this bill on entities who currently receive biosolids from our member systems will raise operating costs, constrain their ability to receive biosolids in the future, and reduce investments in all other important projects. Stated another way, in seeking to fix one environmental issue related to PFAS, this bill, if not further amended, will likely create new environmental challenges. In thank conclusion- you. Okay, thank you. Oh. If you could wrap up, thanks. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Th thank, thank you for your testimony, sir. <laughs> Uh, I will now open it up to questions from the committee, Representative Babich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, Mr. Blanchett, thank you for testifying. Um, as, a, as a representative of the state association, can, can you very briefly share with me what the current status is uh, in, in 2021 with regard to uh, disbursement of, of uh, your biosolids? Uh, speaking for the Brunswick Sewer District, we take uh, all of our biosolids to uh, Park Ridge and Unity, Maine to have it composted. Uh, we got out of the land application program about five years ago. Thank you. Okay. Is, is, is it to your knowledge, uh, other, other municipalities are, have a similar arrangement? Well, they did a year ago when uh, basically DEP prohibited any land spreading. Uh, they, I won't say they, uh, Casella as the most, as the largest uh, compost producer in the state, worked with DEP to do a lot of testing at their facility first to see what amount of PFAS was in there. And they were basically uh, in simple language, allowed to continue the operation because the process did not show the kind of uh, excessive limits of PFAS as you were seeing in the biosolids or in the fields. So as they went back into operation, most of the facilities had to turn to composting as the only means to uh, dispose of the biosolids. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Babbage. And there will be representatives of other utilities um, testifying. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blanchett. And seeing no other questions, if you could lower your hand, Representative Babbage, that would be great. Uh, the Judiciary Committee appreciates your uh, testimony today, sir. Thank you all. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Bradley Sawyer. Mr. Sawyer, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Um, please begin your testimony uh, whenever you're comfortable and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Representative and members of the committee. My name is Brad Sawyer. I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Maine Rural Water Association and a resident of Augusta, uh, about a half a mile from the State House. Um, Maine Rural Water is here to testify neither for nor against on LD363 and LD627. We are a member-driven nonprofit that is based in Richmond and specializes in training, technical assistance, and advocacy on behalf of our roughly 300 members. Our membership is made up of water and wastewater utilities from around the state that are, are committed to ensuring clean and safe drinking water and a healthy environment through the proper treatment of wastewater. Rural water understands that the, uh, the necessity for Mainers who have suffered economically and physically due to PFAS contamination to have a fair attempt at recouping losses. We strongly support the notion that the manufacturers and distributors of these chemicals should be on the hook for remediation costs and not the average Mainer. Wastewater treatment facilities are not creators of these compounds, but rather unwilling receivers due to the PFAS laden human waste and industrial waste that is brought to their facility. At this point, it's extremely likely that we all have some amount of PFAS in our body and are inadvertently contributing to this problem. I myself am no exception. I ironically noticed that while I was writing this testimony, I was wearing a fleece that likely contained PFAS. Uh, we appreciate that both pieces of legislation retain the protections for public entities that are found in the Maine Tort Claims Act. The taxpayers, as you call them, rate payers, as we call them, uh, should not be left holding the bill after decades of unknowingly using these chemicals. I've said to other committees this year, uh, my first time in front of you all, uh, that when considering PFAS legislation, we, we hope folks will consider the entire issue instead of uh, single pieces of legislation in front of them. I understand that's a little different thought than normally goes into bills. Um, these bills are all part of a puzzle and uh, continue to leave some liability for publicly owned treatment works, uh, but we're, we believe that's not the ultimate goal of this legislation. 
Uh, rural Water has taken steps to start discussions with utilities, both in Maine and around the country on the issue of PFAS. And we hope to play an active role in helping to solve this problem. And we hope that you all will, will view us as a resource um, in moving forward in this conversation. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have now or at a future date. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sawyer. We appreciate your being here today and representing the interests of the Rural Water, Water uh, Association. Are there any questions for Mr. Sawyer from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you again uh, for your testimony. I will turn it over now thank to you. the last person that I have uh, listed to speak. I will check the attendee room one more time, but I'd like to welcome Bruce Berger. Um, welcome to the Judici Judiciary Committee meeting, sir. Um, please feel free to proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Harnett and the honorable members of the Judiciary, the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Maine Water Utilities Association, and we appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony neither for nor against for LD363 and LD627. Maine Water Utilities Association is a nonprofit association, much like Maine Rural Water, that's uh, based here in Augusta. We provide support for water, works, and wastewater professionals throughout the state of Maine in advocating for safe drinking water through educational and technical programming, as well as advocacy on the local, state, and national levels. The association was formed in 1925 and counts approximately 109 water and wastewater utilities in the state of Maine as members. Managers and operators of water and wastewater systems are committed to protecting public health and the environment. It's part of our daily routine. Water and wastewater systems are neither producers or users of what uh, is now coined as PFAS. Unfortunately, some water and wastewater systems, have you, as you've already heard, are unwitting conveyors of this material because we receive it uh, in the waters and uh, in the waste stream. Testing for PFAS in drinking water, wastewater, and biosolids has been occurring for less than 10 years, and only in the past several years has the testing technology become adequate to clearly identify PFAS at very low levels, parts per trillion. Only about 35 of the thousands of PFAS co compounds are currently tested for in drinking water. If a water system source of drinking water was contaminated with PFAS, that contamination was likely delivered to consumers. If the water utility removes the PFAS through the treatment process, the PFAS will be found in the residual material it must dispose of in uh, the waste. If a wastewater utility receives PFAS in the wastewater it receives from customers, that PFAS will be found in the wastewater discharge as well as in the biosolids it must dispose of. While we strongly support the effort to hold polluters and manufacturers responsible, we are concerned about the broad language of LD363 and 627 and how it may have an unintended consequence of subjecting water and wastewater utilities to liability exposure, including a costly duty to defend in court for the activities of others, which utilities have little control over. As the local entity, utilities may be the easier target, but are not the proper, proper target of litigation. We do appreciate that both bills include language expressly stating the extended discovery rule for PFAS uh, and will not uh, supersede applicability of the Maine Torts Claim Act. However, this exemption does not cover water utilities that are operated by private companies. Uh, oh, my time's up. So we believe that uh, uh, the water utilities need to be protected. And in conclusion, we'd appreciate the opportunity to provide commentary on this bill in a work session. And we again encourage the committee to revise the bill to ensure that all water utilities are treated equally. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Berger, for taking the time to present your testimony today. And we certainly look forward to seeing you at an upcoming work session. Uh, are there questions from any committee members for Mr. Berger? Representative Babich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to prolong this, but I, I just want to take advantage of Mr. Berger's expertise before we leave the discussion. Mr. Berger, I, I uh, shared your concerns when this uh, came around last time. And um, 
I uh, was largely uh, uh, pleased with uh, what Representative Babbitt, you're on mute. I may have done that inadvertently. Trust me, it was inadvertent. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take you at your word. Take you at your word, not, Mr. Chairman. I was trying to get your hand down, figuring that <laughs> Go ahead. I've known you've wanted that power for a long time, but thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, Mr. Berg, I just wanted to take advantage. I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic, but um, I, uh, I, I am pleased with uh, where I think this bill is heading. My question to you uh, is, is a follow up on my past uh, concern. Um, I, I wondered what the current status of where biosolids go. Uh, and I'd also like you to comment, if you could, um, uh, uh, as, as far as uh, what is the, um, do, do you have notification requirements to um, the, the, the rate payers, I guess, regarding uh, things that you may learn uh, 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 that, that could be a contaminant in the water? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, because that's the only liability that I would, I would be, maybe not uh, interested in exempting if, if in fact they were that kind of uh, malfeasance or whatever, but certainly I sympathize with everything else you've said. So thank you. If you could address that. Thanks. Sure. So yeah, we're, we're in the strict, strict standards uh, by the drinking water program for testing. And that includes PFAS. Uh, someone testified earlier today that uh, the, uh, any PFAS testing takes place outside the state. Um, they're fairly expensive. There are only a certain uh, components of uh, PFAS. Like we said, there's thousands of compounds. The EPA um, is moving towards us testing for, I think, upwards of 37 uh, soon for that. But uh, um, though, yes, we're under regulation to test the drinking water and DEP regulates any testing for biosolids. Okay, that's good. Thank does it you. help? Yep. It does. Thank you, uh, Representative Babbage, and thank you, Mr. Berger. Are there any additional questions from other members of the committee for Mr. Berger? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us today and the information that you provided. Great, thank great you. Appreciate it. Uh, I am going to take one last look in the attendee room. That is the last person that indicated an interest in testifying today. I would ask someone to raise their hand if they want to be heard and seeing none, having received the testimony of those present today, I will now close the public hearing on LD numbers 363 and 627. Thank you very much. We are now going to move on to our last LD of the morning and that is LD 560. And I will remind participants today that the uh, sponsor will have unlimited time to speak, but others testifying will be on a three minute clock. So at this point, I am happy to welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Representative Patrick Corey. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Unlimited time. Thank you. I, I, I should have chosen my words more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I won't, I won't use it. <laughs> Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Patrick Corey. I represent the people of Wyndham. I'm here to present and speak in favor of LD 560 and act to amend the safe haven laws. I feel strongly that women should be given um, safe options for surrendering unwanted newborns while preserving anonymity. Obviously the decision to give up a baby is heart wrenching. Um, during desperate moments, we need to give options for women um, working in the best interests of their babies and frankly themselves. I am fully aware that there are a lot of issues at play here that lead to infant abandonment um, that are not solved by this bill. I'm sure you will hear testimony today pointing out these matters. I share these concerns. Um, my interest is adding to the list of safe havens for infant surrender. Um, is to provide a reasonable option when all other backstops have failed, a last option to prevent neglect or potentially unintended infanticide. 
Interestingly, when researching this bill, I learned that Austria allows women to give birth anonymously in hospitals, reducing infanticide, um, and the number of babies surrendered um, to baby hatches, that's what they call them there. With that said, they still provide both delivery anonymity and the quote baby hatch options. Um, currently, safe haven baby boxes can be found in Indiana, Ohio, Arkansas, Arizona, and I believe they're working on it in Florida. Internationally, there are a number of countries where similar anonymous options exist. Um, you may hear testimony that children have a right to know who their parents are. Um, I can speak to this a little bit as my adoption through an agency was closed, meaning that I did not know until very recently much about my birth parents. Really open adoptions are the norm today, not then. Um, looking back though, I am thankful for the life I've had knowing that when I was given up, it was a very different time and it had to be very tough on my birth mother. I cannot fully understand her circumstances and do not pretend to. Um, what I'm getting at is that I spent the first 46 years of my life knowing almost nothing about my birth family's health or health history and I survived it. Um, I still do not have complete information on one side, but I still believe anonymity should exist in some situations. I will do my best um, answering any questions this committee may have. I look forward to working with this committee to produce a law that works for women in crisis and the babies that need our help. Um, so open it up to questions and thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Corey, and thank you for bringing this bill forward today. Are there questions from members of the committee for Representative Corey? Remember, I have unlimited time to answer your questions. I was given that. <laughs> so it, was, it was just unlimited time to speak. Oh, oh. Um, apparently, nobody wants to take us up on that, Representative Corey. So I thank you very much for introducing the bill and look forward to uh, working through issues in a work session as, as they arise. Thank you all. You, you've had a rough morning in terms of all, taking in a lot of testimony. So I appreciate your open ears. Thanks. And I see we have a co-sponsor of the bill, uh, Representative Marianne Kinney, who would like to be heard. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. And uh, please you. go ahead when you're comfortable. Sure thing. Um, Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee, I am Marianne Kinney. I represent House District 99 which are the towns of Brooks, Burnham, Freedom, Jackson, Knox, Monroe, Thorndike, Troy, and Unity in Waldo County. Very interested in your previous bill that you were uh, discussing, but I'm not going to discuss that one. And I, I spared you having any testimony from me on that one, <laughs> although I was a co-sponsor there as well. I am here to testify in support of LD560, a safe haven, um, additional safe haven places for women who for whatever reason, have decided that they wanted to continue their pregnancy rather than abort their children and have them have a chance at life beyond the means that they may be able to do is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, this law, this, this bill extends where the, a woman can drop off a child, a baby under, th under 31 days old, a safe haven box is just, is, described very um, particularly in this bill under section two and just provides for further safety when a woman is at her darkest moment when she just doesn't know what to do, where to turn, gives her an opportunity. And as representative Corey mentioned that he's having, he's, he's finding some of his information on his health uh, from one side, but not necessarily from the other. The anonymity piece is not as detrimental to an adopted child with everyone that's going through and doing their DNA history. It's amazing what people can find out about their own health just from their DNA. I have been working on a weight loss program. And one of the things that they wanna do is do a DNA history to find out what foods will affect me as far as my weight loss. So there are a lot of things that our DNA can tell us without having to know the, the, the history from our other family members. I encourage you to pass this legislation to give mothers who are in that dark, dark spot a chance to 
safely deposit a child with someone who will be more than happy to lovingly take care of that little baby. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Representative Kinney, and thank you for coming to testify in front of our committee today. Are there questions from any committee members for Representative Kinney? Seeing none again, I thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to be with thank us you. this morning. Thank you. I'm going to head back to my other committee. That's how we work. <laughs> next, next door. <laughs> Um, the next person and all I have listed are people testifying in favor, but I will check that before we conclude this hearing. The first person I have is Isabella Lampkin. Uh, Ms. Lampkin, if you could unmute your mic. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Um, we look forward to hearing your testimony. I will be starting a three minute clock when you begin to testify. So welcome and proceed when you're comfortable. Thank you so much for having me. I, Again, my name is Isabel Lampkin. I am 15 years old, and I live in Louisville, Kentucky. When I was born in China, and when I was two days old, my birth parents, they dropped me outside of an orphanage. And I was lucky enough for somebody to be able to find me. And I lived in the orphanage um, until I was almost seven years old. Then I was adopted by my amazing family that I have now. But unfortunately, not all babies um, are as lucky as I was and given the chance as I was because babies, we can't, as babies, they can't control their temperature, which means when they are left in um, unsafe environment or when they are thrown in trash cans, it doesn't give them that chance at life. And that is one reason why I support Safe Haven Baby Boxes so much because the boxes are insulated, which means when the birth parents put their baby inside of this box, um, number one, it sets an alarm off on the inside, which is alerting the staff. So it's they are there in less than five minutes and then well in less than one minute and then the fire um people are there in less than five and taking making sure this baby is healthy and safe and this is the best um for giving this child a chance at life in other ways that maybe it sh uh, wouldn't have and if the birth parent has other up um ways if they already have a family that's looking for a baby and they want to um and they want to give the baby to that family then we want them to take that opportunity but we want them to also have this option because maybe they don't have any other options and they don't know what to do so we want them to have this and give this baby the best chance at living because you never know what it could do someday and i like to um say that i am living proof of that because i wouldn't be able to be here today if my birth parents hadn't done what they did and and for the and also God for giving me the opportunities that I have to be able to be here. And I know who I know people who, who oppose this law says, but my mom also has a saying and she says that don't let perfect get in the way of good. And in a perfect world, people who find themselves with a child would dedicate everything and making sure that this child was loved and cared for. In a perfect world, people who were not ready to have kids would not get pregnant. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. The reality is that babies are far more likely to be adopted than older children that are getting out of an unsafe situation. The fact is, while safe haven laws are a step in the right direction are not as helpful as safe haven baby boxes are because of the fear or shame on the part of the parent and this gives them the best opportunity for them and a lot of people um will ask well why is this parent doing this like how dare they and stuff but sometimes i feel like what they don't understand that 
is that they are strong for doing this. They are strong for putting this baby inside of this box instead of leaving them in an unsafe situation because they know that they can't give them the best life that they can, but they know that somebody else is able to. And I feel that that's what my birth parents um, saw because I have a lot of disabilities and they knew that they couldn't take care of me, but they still wanted the best chance for me. So they did what they did. Thank you. And I thank you very much, Ms. Lampkin. Uh, if you could wrap it up, please. That would yes, be I'm so sorry. Um, I humbly, I humbly yet strongly ask that you support this law and support making your state, Maine, um, even better and just supporting the children. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for coming here today and sharing a very personal story. We greatly appreciate it. Thank are you for there, having me. Are there questions from any committee members for Ms. Lampkin? Senator Keim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Lampkin. Thanks for joining us. I just was curious, did, is this a law in your state? Um, I, safe Haven baby boxes are not in my state um, yet. I am actually doing the same thing that I'm doing right now with you guys in my state. So um, we are so close to hopefully passing this legislation and I hope that this will pass hopefully by the end of the year. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Ms. Lampkin? Again, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to visit us from Louisville today. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, the next person I have on my list is Karen Vashon. If Ms. Vashon could be promoted to a panelist. Ms. Vashon, if you could unmute your mic and activate your camera, it, it will be your uh, turn to testify. Okay, hold on. Okay, take your time. Um, if you're struggling with the video, you can you can go ahead. Um, Hey, can you hear me? Hear you fine. We just oh, can't, can't wonderful. Um, uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee and begin your uh, testimony when you're comfortable and I will start the three minute timer. Well, thank you so much for the, uh, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, Representative Harnett and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Karen Vashon and I am the Executive Director of Maine Right to Life located in Auburn. I come before you today in support of LD 560, an act to amend safe haven laws, and I thank Representative Corey for sponsoring this bill. Maine Right to Life is a state affiliate of the National Right to Life Committee. We are a nonprofit organization founded to protect and uphold the dignity and worth of every human life from conception to natural death by making abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia socially, ethically, and legally unacceptable, and to actively promote positive alternatives. Imagine the fear for a young, passive, small town gal and what she may feel. She misses her period. Could it be she's pregnant? Living in a rural community, isolated from friends and feeling confused, the feelings could include denial, anxiety, and fear, to tell or not to tell. She, ca she casts the changes happening inside of her body aside and does nothing. Denial has set in. She hopes it will go away. Sudden, suddenly she finds herself in labor, delivering a baby alone. She doesn't want anyone to know. She just wants the whole ordeal to go away. She doesn't wanna hurt anybody. She doesn't wanna hurt her baby. She wants her baby to go to a good home without anyone knowing she ever had this baby. What she does next could affect her emotional, mental, 
and physical well being for the rest of her life. Under current main law, childhood abandonment is illegal. This bill would simply amend the safe haven law decriminalizing the act if the baby is paid, passed into safe hands within a few days of life. Baby boxes are not new. The concept is ancient. However, a new crop of baby boxes started making a comeback in the US in 2016. In the past 20 years, countries such as Pakistan, Malaysia, Germany, and Switzerland have revived and modernized the baby box. In medieval times, cylindrical barrels were on the side of hospital churches and orphanages as safe havens for unwanted babies. Today, the nonprofit organization Safe Haven Baby Boxes provides the boxes to local charities. Passage of this bill would permit Maine to offer safe haven baby boxes. Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania have passed laws permitting these boxes and a bill is in progress in New Jersey and efforts are materializing in Georgia. I humbly ask this uh, committee to pass this bill. Any young woman finding herself in a situation deserves a humane option. This bill has a happy ending for all. It saves the life of a newborn, provides a legal anonymity to a young woman, and an opportunity for people looking to adopt. And I thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Vashon, and thank you uh, for being uh, before our committee, what is now this afternoon. Um, are there any questions from committee members for Ms. Vashon? Seeing none, I again thank you uh, for your testimony and look forward to working with you as we work this bill in a work session. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person on my list is Pamela Stencil, who will then be followed by Suzanne Lafreniere. Um, Ms. Stencil. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and the, the members of this judiciary. Uh, I am uh, happy to come in support of LB 560. I am going to um, just give you a little heads up that I'm in Tallahassee and was kicked out of my hotel room at noon. So I have come downstairs and I'm outside. So I apologize for any noise. Hopefully um, that won't be a problem. Um, uh, my name is Pam Stenzel. I'm a founding member of the Board of Directors for Safe Haven Baby Boxes. I'm a licensed therapist in marriage and family therapy, and I am the director of the National Safe Haven Crisis Line. Uh, since we began operating the Na National Safe Haven Crisis Line in March of 2016, we have received over 7,000 calls on our hotline and have assisted hundreds of parents in the safe surrender of their newborn. I have personally taken most of those calls and continue to offer help and hope to women and men in crisis. My experience has shown that one of the biggest hindrances for parents who are considering utilizing existing safe haven laws is anonymity. While surrendering your infant to medical personnel may claim to provide confidentiality, it clearly does not provide anonymity. One such mother in the state of Indiana was terribly frightened of a face-to-face -face surrender and because she lived in a rural area and was not close enough at that time to utilize the existing safe haven baby box, I had to convince her to make a call to 911 and surrender to the paramedics who met her. Of course, one of the firefighters that responded to the call knew this young woman and was a former classmate, so her fears were not unfounded. When you study illegal abandonments across New England as well as across the country, one fact becomes very clear. Most wanted to do the right thing, but fear prevent, prevented them from walking that infant into the hospital or fire station. Many of these women placed their infants near a safe haven surrender location or in a place where they clearly wanted the baby to be found. They were just too afraid of that face-to-face -face encounter. Safe Haven Baby Boxes provides this mother with a way to surrender their I'm unharmed newborn by utilizing a safe, tested, electronically monitored device built into the walls of hospitals or fire stations where the infants will be retrieved and receive medical attention in under five minutes. While it is our desire that mothers in crisis receive help and support surrounding their newborn legally and safely, uh, 
having the opportunity to surrender legally and safely in this device is a last resort option that must be available. A dumpster or trash bin is no place for an infant. These women are crying out for help. And I trust that this body in the state of Maine will hear those cries and provide this beacon of hope to families in crisis in your community. I respectfully request that you vote LD560 as ought to pass. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you very much, Ms. Stencil, and thank you for your ingenuity in setting up your office outside of your hotel. Uh, are there any members of the committee that have questions for Ms. Stencil? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for taking the time to testify before us today. Thank you so much. Um, and the next and last person I have on my list, although I will double check at the end, is Suzanne Lafreniere. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, welcome to the Ju Judiciary Committee and uh, proceed when you're ready and I will start the clock. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Harnett. I'm impressed with your pronunciation of my last name. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Suzanne Lafreniere. I am proud to represent the Roman Catholic Diocese of Portland. The Diocese of Portland consists of all the Catholics in Maine. It's about 290,000 Catholics in Maine. We have 141 churches, Catholic schools, hospitals, and you can't go far without reaching a Catholic institution in this state. I am here to support Safe Haven Baby Boxes and this addition to the Safe Haven Law. A lot of people have mentioned before me about why this is needed. And I think the important thing that I want to bring to your attention is the difference between confidentiality and anonymity. Maine is one small town. I am never going to be a real Mainer. I moved here 17 years ago when I met my husband and we got married and I moved here. But I learned very quickly that Maine, Mainers know each other. Mainers are about one person degree separation. There's no such thing as the Kevin Bacon game here in Maine. It's like the one person game in Maine. I think we need to keep in mind that the Safe Haven Baby Box is that option that creates a way for a child to be surrendered without shame or stigma. Stigma. A lot of people want to avoid that physical hand off um, to a firefighter, to the ER doc, whoever it is. If you want to look at what are the procedures right now for Safe Haven and the law for Safe Haven, I um, have that in my testimony as one of the footnotes. It's very clear that right now under the safe haven, the same information is not given. So there is that confidentiality. If a person is handed a child under the safe haven law right now, you can ask for information, but you are not allowed to detain information, that person to receive that information. So if a person is willing to give that, confidentiality is promised, but it is not required that you get any of that information as you receive a child under the surrender law. The question, um, I read all of the testimony that was given ahead of time and the question from the department about what would happen to a child who is 32 days old, that question is a question that's already there. So there's no one to check as you're handing over your child and surrendering your child the date of birth. You don't have to hand over a birth certificate. Um, questions don't need to be asked at all. So I think it's important uh, as a parent myself, as an adoptee myself, I think it's very important to give Maine women and men, parents, um, this option to do what's best for their children without shame or stigma. Thanks very much, and I hope you vote this, you vote this ought to pass. Thank you very much for your testimony today. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Kime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for being here today, uh, Ms. Lafreniere. Um, can, and, and if you stated this already, I'm sorry, I had to grab a call, but d can you tell us what states uh, this is in the works in or other states that may have already passed this? Sure, the, the most um, ubiquitous state that has this already is Indiana. There's, I don't know how many, but there are a lot of them in Indiana. Um, there's three other states, I believe, that Pam probably knows the information um, off the top of her head, but there are mm -hmm. other states that have this. It's in the works in Florida. That's why Pam's in Florida. She was testifying on behalf of that organization in Florida. It, it was interesting because I had never met or heard um, 
the first testifier after uh, Representative Corey's testimony before, but I do know in Kentucky they're working on this as well. So mm -hmm. this is something that uh, really is needed. Just just in the last month, there was an abandoned child in, Dor in right outside of Boston. So unfortunately, this is a last resort, but it is a resort that's that's needed in the state of Maine and really all over New England. So these bills are being tried other places too. I can get that specific information for the work session though. Yeah, that, and I guess just how long it's been in, been active in a, in a state because, you know, it's, you know, what is the worst case scenario kind of thing? I think it's just always a good thing to think of, but there are a lot of worst case scenarios. So I think this is a good, this is a good option, but I, I would love to hear what's happening other places. So. Sure. And I, I think it's important just to, to point out as well that uh, all of these boxes, if got, hopefully the, uh, the bill passes, it's all voluntary at, at an institution and they're all privately funded. So there would okay. be no fiscal note. Right. Good. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Keim. Are there any questions from other committee members? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for your testimony today. And we'll look forward to working with you at the work session if, if as needed. Uh, I am going to check one last time in the attendee room to see if there is anybody else who is interested in testifying either in support of this legislation, in opposition to the legislation, or neither for nor against. And seeing none, I will, having received the testimony of those present today, I will now close the public hearing on LD 560. I thank the committee for their hard work this morning and uh, thank everyone who came to testify. And given the time, we will reconvene at 1.15 so that committee members can get a break to do something other than sit and stare at your screen. Um, and with that, I would remind everyone to mute their mic and shut off their camera and we will get together again at 115. Thank you all.
be in good hands. Okay. Open the crystal. He has all the stuff that he needs. I just made him officially. He's the host. Okay. So um, you are the co-host, you know. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's just about 1.15. I am going to wait for my committee to show up. Uh, it's 1.14. I'm sure they're all going to just jump on in the next 60 seconds and welcome our um, clerk for this afternoon, Christian Ritchie. Thank you for your help today. And as soon as we get a quorum, we're going to get going. Representative Harnett, I was just going to let you know that I'm, I'm here and I'm listening. I'm just going to turn my camera off because I'm still eating my lunch. Fair enough. We still have to wait for more faces. One, two, three, four, five, six. Christian, if you can hear me, uh, Representative Maggie O'Neill would be the first person let in. She'll be introducing LD 690 once we have a quorum. Would you like me to bring her into the panel now? Sure. I know she has some time constraints. Still waiting for a few members, so we have a quorum. Oh, I don't need this one. Given the yeah. given the the Good length. Good afternoon. Um, Representative Harnett, is it okay if I introduce myself since I was uh, in other committee meetings this morning? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, my name is Ann Carney. I represent Senate District 29, which is uh, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and part of Scarborough. And I'm happy to join the committee this afternoon. Thank you. It's good to have you. You missed a fascinating morning. I know. Uh, I'm sorry I did. Uh, we, we have a very full docket this afternoon, so we do have enough members to get going. I am going to begin. We have three public hearings this afternoon, the first being LD 690, uh, and then I will turn things over after that to uh, my Senate chair. Um, just to bring people uh, back to where we were this morning, um, 
this is a, a virtual hearing being held on an electronic platform. I will first call on the sponsor of the bill, listen to any co-sponsors if there are some who want to testify, then hear testimony from the persons testifying for the bill, then against the bill, and then neither for nor against. Remember that everything you're saying is being recorded and will be available in taped format on the legislat legislature's YouTube channel at the end of the day. While the bill sponsor um, has as much time as she needs to talk to introduce her bill, uh, all others testifying um, will be limited to three minutes um, just because of the amount of work we have to get through this afternoon. So with that, I will now open the public hearing on LD 690 and I am pleased to welcome to the Judiciary Committee Representative Maggie O'Neill uh, to present her bill. Welcome Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Maggie O'Neill. I represent District 15, which is in Saco. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to present LD 690, which is an act to ensure that victims of assault, battery, and false imprisonment, including victims of domestic violence, have parity under tort law. Um, first, I'll start out with some background. The idea for this bill came out of a conversation that we had in my torts class at Maine Law. One of the um, neat things about being in school and serving in the legislature at the same time is that we discuss opportunities to improve the law in class, and I have an opportunity to act on those conversations. Um, so during class, we were reading a main case in which a person experienced domestic violence, and she was not able to bring a claim for either battery or assault because the two-year statute of limitations had passed. The plaintiff um, had previously gotten a divorce from her husband. She experienced um, physical abuse during their marriage. And a few years after their divorce was finalized, she brought a civil claim for abusive treatment. Our professor um, happened to work on that particular case. And she remarked that the plaintiff had been limited in what action she could bring because there's a two year statute of limitations on assault and battery claims. Because of the limitation, the woman instead brought a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress, which gave her six years to bring a claim. And we talked about um, how there wasn't a real reason for the difference in time allowed to bring a claim other than history. IIED happens to be a newer claim and it has a six year limitation like other torts. So here's what we are proposing to change. In Maine, a person usually has six years to bring a tort claim, such as IIED or negligence. In contrast, there's a separate section for assault, battery, and false imprisonment that says a person only has two years to bring those claims. This bill would bring the statute of limitations for these three claims in line with most torts at six years. And to be clear, this impacts civil litigation, not criminal. I have worked with um, UMaine School of Law professor Jenny Riggins on this measure. Um, professor Riggins is the person I told you about who taught us about this discrepancy in class. She wrote a law review article on this subject, which I um, have cited to in my testimony if anybody's interested in it. And she couldn't identify a compelling reason to treat assault, battery, and false imprisonment differently. She's here today um, to be a resource for the committee. So she'll be coming up to testify afterward. Um, and finally, for survivors of domestic violence, two years is often an insufficient time to bring a claim, particularly considering the time it can take to extricate oneself from an abusive or violent situation. Um, this bill was compelling to me because in my own experience with domestic violence, I knew that um, I didn't want to pursue criminal charges. And if I had decided that bringing a civil claim was something that I wanted to do, I knew that I wouldn't have had enough time to get back on my feet and heal beforehand. Um, we also know that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated challenges around bringing claims within the two year window that's currently required. The pandemic has caused serious delays within our court systems and it's unclear how long it will take to resolve the backlog. So this level of uncertainty is likely to impact when survivors are able 
um, and ready to move forward with civil litigation. So I thank you for your consideration and your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Representative O'Neill, and thank you for uh, bringing this important piece of legislation oh. forward. Are there any members of the committee who have questions for Representative O'Neill? Uh, Senator Carney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative O'Neill, for presenting this legislation. Uh, I have a question about the effective date of the legislation, and have you uh, thought at all about um, what happens to claims that currently are barred, but if this uh, bill passed, would uh, still be within the six year look back period? Have you thought about how those claims might be treated? I and have. Particularly about the, the pandemic's impact on, on bringing claims and how this might be a, a time to try to address that as well. Thank you, Senator, for the question. I think that's a great catch. It's not something that um, that I contemplated, but I would welcome your input. And um, and I think we'll have folks from the Trial Lawyer Association um, speaking afterward, but I would love to work with you on that to make it work. Thanks. I, I will ask the other uh, folks who are testifying as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carney. Do you have additional questions? No. Nope. Thank you. Are there other members of the committee with questions for Representative O'Neill? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for coming before the Judiciary Committee today. I know you have a busy afternoon, um, but we appreciate your time and um, your expertise in bringing this forward. So thank you. Thanks again. The, Thanks. You're very welcome. The first person that I have testifying in favor of LD 690 is, and I will remind all those about to testify that I will be running a three minute clock. I'll hold it up with about 15 seconds left. Nobody ever looks at it and sees it. And then I'll have to tell you when the three minutes is up. Um, but the first person is uh, Andrea Mancuso. So if she could be promoted to a panelist. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Hernett, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Andrea Mancuso, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of the main coalition to end domestic violence in support of LD 690. Thank you to Representative O'Neill for bringing this bill forward. For a variety of reasons, um, some mentioned by Representative O'Neill, and some of which we've highlighted in our testimony, the two-year limitation on the ability to file a civil suit against a person who's caused actionable harm will unjustly limit the ability of many survivors of domestic violence to fully recover financial damages. Nearly one in three women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Orbital, mandibular, and nasal fractures are the most commonly injured body parts in intimate partner violence. Nearly one in 10 women will be strangled by an intimate partner, and in the absence of death, brain injuries are one of the most devastating and long-lasting consequences of strangulation. In one study uh, a couple of years ago, traumatic brain injury from injury to the head or strangulation was as high as 50% of the sample of women studied who had experienced intimate partner violence, and these injuries can have lifetime economic impacts on survivors. In 2019, this committee heard testimony from Rachel, a survivor of strangulation um, who, whose uh, assault really had a devastating impact on her ability to provide financially for herself and for her son, and that will have lifetime consequences for her. She had described to the committee that before the assault, she had been economically independent with a good job, 401k, assets, a good credit score. When she attempted to separate from her partner, he strangled her to the point of unconsciousness. This caused both brain and spinal cord injuries that resulted in her losing much of her executive functioning, short-term memory, and money management skills. She lost her job. She lost her home through the foreclosure process. She had medical debt um, that she's still triaging. And her credit score was irreparably damaged. And the only way she has to support herself and her son now um, is disability. For survivors like Rachel, a two-year time limit doesn't take into account the realities of their lived experience. There, for a lot of survivors, time is needed to heal, to address 
the trauma impacts on themselves and their children to understand and to experience and have diagnosed the full impact of the damage caused, particularly when it comes to traumatic brain injury. Added to this, the person who used the violence um, when they're arrested and prosecuted, many advisors will be advised um, both by the prosecution and by any counsel that they've obtained to wait to initiate civil litigation until the criminal proceeding has concluded. This can sometimes take a year or two, depending on the complexity of the case, even in normal times. And I think we've all been hearing quite uh, firmly from the judicial branch that criminal cases have piled up as a result of the pandemic. and. Um, with trials suspended, even for criminal cases, the criminal dockets are huge and gonna take a long time to resolve and civil court cases are similarly very uh, much backed up. Many survivors are also not readily able to separate from an abuser immediately after an assault, even one that results in long-term injury and damage, particularly for survivors who share children with their partner or where financial independence would be particularly challenging. This doesn't make the abuse they've suffered or the impact of that abuse any less real and any less worthy of redress. And so for those reasons, we encourage you to support this bill and create parity in our tort laws for those who have been subject to intentional acts. Thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts and welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Mancuso. We appreciate your coming before the committee and offering your testimony today. Are there members of the committee with questions for Ms. Mancuso? Seeing none, uh, again, thank you very much for your time and we uh, look forward to perhaps seeing you at a work session when we um, finalize this. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, next person to testify is Jennifer Riggins. She could be moved into the panelist role. And good afternoon, uh, Ms. Riggins. Thank you for being here before the Judiciary Committee today to testify. Um, begin when you are comfortable, and I, I will remind you when three minutes is up. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Jennifer Riggins. As you know, I live in Portland, Maine. I'm a professor at the University of Maine School of Law. I'm also a lawyer. I've taught at Maine Law for 24 years. I teach torts, a foundational required course that deals with compensation for harm caused by wrongs. I'm speaking not as a representative of the University of Maine School of Law or the University of Maine, but as an individual with specialized knowledge in this area. Representative O'Neill summarized the bill, the current state of the law, and the context very well. Basically, this bill will mean that people injured by assault, battery, and false imprisonment, like victims of car accident carelessness, car accident negligence, will have six years to seek compensation. There are three reasons why I wish you will support this bill, and they're in my written testimony. In the interest of time, I will just focus on one. The only reason for the shorter time limit for intentional torts like assault and battery is an act of parliament that was passed in 1623. When I was writing an article about domestic violence and torts some years ago, I tried to figure out the reason for the difference between the statute of limitations for things like assault and battery on the one hand and things like carelessness negligence on the other hand. And I found that the origin of this idea that there should be shorter statute of limitations for intentional wrongs like assault and battery was an act of parliament that was passed in 1623. Now, no one knows why parliament decided in 1623 that statutes of limitations should be shorter for intentional torts and then for the torts that eventually evolved into negligence. But what we do know is that most state statute of limitations derive from the 1623 act of parliament. State statutes nationwide generally lump assault, battery, and false imprisonment together in a short time period and typically have a longer time period for other actions like negligence. But the fact that this distinction has been in the law for a long time is no reason for it to continue. Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes stated in 1897, it is revolting to have no better justification for a law that, that it was laid down in the time of Henry IV. I looked this up and this act of parliament here was laid down in the time of King Charles I, more than 100 years before the time of King Henry IV. 
There's no good reason this law should still be on the books. The bill is a good and fair solution for the future, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Representative Harnett, I think you're muted. I realized I was muted that whole time, yes. Thank you for your testimony and for providing your expertise uh, to the committee. I have now opened it up for questions and I see that Senator Carney has a question. Senator Carney. Thank you very much, Representative Harnett. And Professor Riggins, it's very nice to see you again. I'm an alum of the University of Maine School of Law. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to ask you the same question I asked Maggie. Do you think that it's important to try to create some mechanism that addresses um, claims that perhaps expired, but would be within the six year, I'll look back from the effective date of this measure if we were to adopt it. I honestly am not familiar with the, the constitutional issues or the statutory issues, the policy issues involving retroactivity of statutes of limitations. So I would defer to others on that question. Okay, we'll, we'll figure out um, who can help us with that. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Senator Carney. Are there questions from any other members of the committee? Seeing none, again, I thank you uh, very much for your time, Professor Riggins, and uh, appreciate your input and expertise. Thank you, and thank you all for your public service. Thank you. The uh, next and last individual that I have listed to testify, although I will check the attendee room before Closing the hearing is Michael Bigos on behalf of the Maine Trier Lawyers Association. If Mr. Bigos could be uh, promoted to a panelist. Mr. Bigos, as soon as you uh, unmute yourself and activate your camera, you can proceed to testify and welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Oh, great. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Michael Begus. I live in Auburn. I am a trial attorney at Berman and Simmons Law Firm, and I'm a past president of the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. The Maine Trial Lawyers Association supports LD 690. LD 690 would allow victims of assault and battery, as you know, and false imprisonment to seek justice for up to six years instead of the current two year statute of limitations. That would be a helpful change for victims to come forward. Currently, victims of crime are forced to either bring suit early when the liability facts and damages are frequently not known or fully developed. You've also heard about criminal cases are usually pending and criminal defendants have the right to remain silent until their case is done and their appeal period has expired. Or cr criminal victims or victims of crimes often have to wait and lose their rights until after the two year period and plead negligence or recklessness within the current six year statute of limitations for those other things. Those are sort of practical stretches of uh, and sort of a creating a, a, um, a false uh, cause of action uh, to try to resurrect what their rights would be because they cannot make the claims under intentional act statutes. So does, if somebody intends, intends to harm someone, um, and then you, you've missed your statute of limitations, then you're pleading, well, oh, they were, they were negligent. They didn't really mean it, or they weren't reasonable under the circumstances. It's kind of a judicial fiction, which uh, victims of crimes are now currently forced to, uh, to make. They can also, again, label and call that recklessness. The current legal framework makes it harder for these victims of crime to bring their claims. LD 690 makes it easier. It allows more remedies the most important of which may be punitive damages for claims that are collectible. Punitive damages, as most of you know, are allowed when there's uh, actual or implied malice. And our law court uh, opinions for the last several decades have, have made it very, very difficult if you don't have actual malice to bring a claim. And punitive damages are important in some cases to bring a full measure of justice. 
Most civil claims for acts that are crimes are not covered by insurance because of policy exclusions. So practically, we're talking about a class of case of civil claims that this bill would affect uh, where the wrongdoer has assets to satisfy a judgment. On a practical level, the main trial lawyers association members is, are often not able to take a case unless there's some sort of collectible uh, judgment. Because as the expression goes, you can't get blood from a stone. Because this legislation would nevertheless help many victims of domestic violence bring their claims, I've attached an article that I wrote about how these claims tend to work. I think all of you have that. It gives a real practical outline. It explains a little bit of evidence law. You can actually get in evidence if, if the abuse is a continuum and if the contact happens within the statute of limitations, but the abuse starts before, sometimes you can get in the evidence beforehand. But this, this bill specifically deals with um, you know, how far back um, uh, those, those acts uh, that cause injury uh, can go. Uh, so we do urge the community to support LD 690. Um, I'll, I can say uh, um, a little bit of, based on the questions of Senator Carney, um, the, uh, I think this, the committee uh, has a choice. Um, I, I, I have a legislative drafting manual, but I did not look at it in preparation for today. I think the choices are, and, I, and, and Peggy, and um, I think your other newer staffer who I don't know can tell you, um, you could pick a date you can just pick a date. Um, you can uh, go six years back from the effective date of the legislation, which I'm not sure when you all adjourn this year, but maybe let's say July 1, 2021, you could say, okay, six years back and just put that right in the bill. You could also do a prospective application from the date of effectiveness forward. That would basically grow the statute from two years and one hour to six years but it would take six years to get there. Um, that, that would be the least, that would be the most sort of, um, you know, uh, restrictive. Um, my suggestion, you know, for to benefit victims the most is actually pick the date. Don't just go with a, a broad six year, just pick a date. And then everybody would have notice as of the day you amend and the day it gets uh, enacted and so forth, signed by the governor of something like July 1, 2015 is you know july one minus six years Bye. so for so for a bill that was uh, i can't think of a better day saint patrick's day for uh, changing a law enacted by parliament during the reign of king george the first in 623 than saint patrick's day thank you very much thank you mr bigos are there questions from the committee for mr bigos seeing none i thank you on behalf of the committee for your testimony today and uh, we'll struggle with that uh, application of the, the law during our work session. Thank you. That is all of the folks that I've had signed up, but I am going to go into the attendee room to make sure that there's nobody else who wants to testify in LD 690. If you are interested in testifying in favor of LD 690, could you please raise your electronic hand? If you seeing none, if you're interested in testifying in opposition to, uh, I see Jan Collins. Um, if we could promote Ms. Collins to the role of panelist and we will hear her testimony. Thank you, um, Ms. Collins. And I didn't, are you testifying in favor? Yes, thank you. Um, when I signed up to testify, the only available bill for this afternoon was LD 589. And um, my testimony is actually for all three of the bills for this afternoon. Um, so. Okay. Well, if you could uh, focus your testimony on just LD 690 right now, um, that would be wonderful. Greetings, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jan Collins. I'm an Assistant Director of Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition, and I'm here to support LD 690, LD 589, and LD 688. MPAC's mission is to support Maine's incarcerated citizens, their families, and friends in their struggle with Maine's criminal justice system. 
Our purpose is to reduce Maine's use of incarceration by creating a criminal justice system that is ethical, humane, and restorative in nature. Anyone who has worked with incarcerated men and women is aware of the almost universal history of trauma for these individuals. Unfortunately, there are very few studies being done that would allow us the statistics needed to quantify this trauma. My review found large gaps in the literature. A US Department of Justice study in 1999 and a National Institute of Health study in 2009. Both studies found elevated percentages of inmates who as children were subjected to either or both sexual and physical abuse. I quote, quote from the NIH study, it is noteworthy that half or more of all male and female inmates reported childhood physical victimization. More specifically, 56% of all male inmates experienced physical abuse as children, as did 54% of all female inmates. By contrast, slightly less than 10% of all male inmates compared to 47% of all female inmates reported childhood sexual victimization. Since passage of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, Bureau of Statistics 2004, sexual assault in prison has received more research attention. These studies indicate that many inmates will experience continued victimization by physical and sexual abuse in prison. Those who are victimized as children will have an elevated rate of prison victimization. In addition, as the committee has heard in testimony on previous bills, it is almost impossible to prove innocence from a prison cell. Those wrongly accused on average serve over seven years in prison before being released. It is for this reason that MPAC supports the removal of the two-year statute of limitations for assault and battery and for false imprisonment in the tort law. The impact on the lives of people who have been victimized through physical and sexual abuse or false imprisonment does not end with cessation of their abuse. It is a wound they will carry with them throughout their lives. Extending the statute of limitations under the tort law will not heal their wounds. Still, it is the least we can do. I hope um, in all of these bills that you consider today that you will include among the changes for the tort law, false imprisonment. Thank you so much for your consideration and support. Thank you very much, Ms. Collins. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Are there questions from committee members? The first uh, hand that I see is Representative Evangelos. Thank you. Go ahead, Thank Jeff. You, Representative Evangelos. I, um, it didn't dawn on me to um, ask the law school professor, um, the expert on tort law, um, until I heard Jan's words in reference to false imprisonment. So Jan, is it your understanding that <clears throat> if it, does this include in your view, false imprisonment by the state? I would, I would include false imprisonment by the state as a form of abuse as well. So you, that's your remarks. I thought that's where you were driving at. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah. <clears throat> Representative Harnett, <clears throat> I don't know if we could um, ask the law school professor that or whether she's going to be um, weighing in on the other bills, but I wanted to get her take on that also. Thank you for that, Jen. Thank you, Representative Evangelos. I think we would have to hold that for a work session. I'm not even sure she is still on the call. Are there other questions from members of the committee? And I'm just going to check the attendee room. Um, would you like that question directed at Professor Riggins, Representative Evangelos? Yes, and uh, perhaps with one of the two other bills, uh, I'll get another shot at one of the experts. So okay. I'm, I'm not sure how long uh, the professor is going to be here, but if we could promote uh, Professor Riggins back as a panelist see if she can address the question from Representative Evangelos. I'd be happy to wait till the work session if it's not possible. Thank you, Representative Arnett. Okay. 
Did I quickly Best answer or, to... or you want to wait till the work session? I don't care. Do you have a, a, a quick, easy yeah, answer? This, or I mean, this doesn't change what the law of false imprisonment is. It doesn't change immunity that the state has for lots of things. It doesn't change any of that. So it's about, you know, tort claims, which are civil claims. And it just changes the statute of limitations for that. So if something is, you know, if the state is protected from uh, immunity for, from a lot of claims like the state is, this doesn't change that. It just state changes the timing. Thank you. Thank you. So to be clear, then it's, um, this is more directed at private individuals and it's, it might be a stretch because of the state's claims of immunity to um, uh, make it apply to the state when they falsely incarcerate somebody? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't change whatever the law is about that. And, you know, this, the, and um, the state has lots of different kinds of immunity under the, under the law. There's a state tort claims act, which applies to bar a lot of claims against the state. Um, and so this doesn't change any of that. So the hurdles to hold the state accountable will, would be different um, just by referencing what you just said versus an individual. As the that is, that's absolutely correct, yes. We're, we're looking at some other options, but thank you for that valuable input. Sure. Thank you, Professor Riggins. Thank you, Representative sure. Evangelos. I am going to go into the attendee room again to see if there is anybody else who wants to testify in favor of LD 690. Seeing none, I will ask if there's anybody who wants to testify in opposition to LD 690. Seeing none, I will ask if there is anybody who wants to testify neither for nor against LD 690. Seeing none, having received all the testimony from persons present today, I now close the public hearing on LD 690 and yield the chair to my Senate co-chair Senator Carney, thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Harnett. And um, next on our agenda this afternoon is LD 589. And we have, I believe the bill sponsor in the uh, attendee room, Representative Gramlich. And um, if, uh, Oh, and here she is coming through cyberspace to join us. Welcome Representative Gramlich to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary and you may proceed with introducing your bill whenever you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney. It's always a pleasure to see you again. We spend quite a bit of time together on another committee. Um, so I will just jump right in. Good afternoon again, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and my esteemed colleagues on the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. My name is Lori Gramlich, and I represent House District 13, which is the community of Old Orchard Beach. Oops, lost my space, pardon me. Um, I am here to present LD 589, an act to provide access to justice for victims of child sexual abuse. Child sexual, sexual abuse is a significant but preventable adverse childhood experience and public health problem. Although estimates vary across studies, the data shows that about one in four girls and one in 13 boys experience child sexual abuse at some point in their childhood. 91% of child sexual abuse is perpetrated by someone the child or the child fa child's family knows. The total lifetime economic burden of child sexual abuse in the United States in 2015 was estimated to cost at least $9.3 billion. However, this is likely an underestimate of the true impact of the problem since child sexual abuse is quite often underreported. Experiencing child sexual abuse is an adverse childhood experience that can affect how a person thinks acts and feels over a lifetime, resulting in short and long-term physical, mental, emotional health consequences. Many children wait to report or never report child sexual abuse even into adulthood. The reasons folks do not disclose vary. However, 
Many survivors of sexual abuse often feel shame, fear, uncertainty, guilt, and often avoid reliving the pain and emotional trauma that these events evoke. Even though sexual assault is never the fault of the victim, often those who experience it feel as if something is wrong with them for having experienced it. Fear of not being believed, fear of retribution, fear of how others may react to you and treat you and fear of being judged are all variables into why some will never disclose. Victims may blame themselves, which lead to, leads to those feelings of guilt and like shame, when someone believes they are guilty of something, it is very difficult to tell others about it. It is not uncommon for people who have experienced sexual assault and abuse to wanna to forget what happened and try to move on. Consequently, many adults have yet to tell anyone that they were sexually abused as a child, not their partners, not their friends, not their family members, not even their therapists. Developmentally, children do not have the emotional and cognitive skills to process such traumatic, adverse childhood experiences. Cognitive skills, including thinking, learning, understanding, problem solving, reasoning, and remembering, in addition to the aforementioned feelings of guilt and shame, will often prevent a child from disclosing. Even well into adulthood, these feelings will often prevent us from disclosing this. I cannot nor would I presume to speak for every survivor. I can only speak for myself. It has taken me many years as an adult to process the atrocities that my siblings and I endured growing up. I knew that I could not change what happened to me, but I also knew that when I got to be a grown up, I would do my very best to make things better for others, to hopefully prevent children from having to endure abuse. As a social worker, I've been working my entire professional life to affect systemic change. And in this case, do my part to give voice to survivors. LD 589 is about justice. Now I know this bill is crafted to include language about tort claims and civil procedures. I will leave the details of those components of this bill to the committee as you are the experts, but let me be clear. The intent of my bill is to eliminate the statute of limitations for childhood childhood sexual abuse survivors, period. For all the reasons described developmentally for children and emotionally and cognitively for adult survivors, the time frame in which survivors feel empowered to speak is variable. When we talk about disclosure, it is about being heard. It is about being believed and it is about justice. And for many, it is about our journey through recovery. I know you'll be hearing from folks who think eliminating the statute of limitations for survivors is a financial burden. You'll hear people talk about insurance as a product and how it costs money. And it'll cost too much money to have a suit against their perpetrator if, if folks choose to do that. For me, this bill isn't about suing someone. Again, it is about justice. Let me ask you to look at this bill through the eyes of a child. Look at it through the eyes of all the adult survivors who may finally be ready to disclose. Examine the implications and costs that this has collectively on our society. Additionally, I will add that the education, educational component of this bill is a worthy initiative to pursue. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions for you, and I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to begin this dialogue on this critically important topic so that we together can find resolution for adult survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Gramlich, for your testimony and for bringing this um, important legislation forward today. I'm looking to members of the committee to see if uh, anyone has questions for Representative Gramlich. I do have one question for you. Could you speak a little bit to the educational component, please? There's um, a section of the bill that talks about providing additional education for the the judicial branch in terms of um, judges and other folks that may be hearing particular claims so that, that we can assure that um, folks are conversant in um, the topic, the subject matter. And I think that's really worthy. Um, we can all certainly um, always be open to having more education, but 
um, historically, um, as you all probably are very well aware, this is a topic that has been very taboo and that folks don't normally come out and speak about. Um, that's why I felt it was critically important that I lend my voice to this topic. Um, and if I may, Senator, particularly for um, our children, and again, we know that, that boys too fall victim to abuse, but if I can in some way be a role model for girls and other women to know that um, they are not defined by their abuse and that they can overcome that in some way, then, then I feel like I've done my job. And so I think education is critically important and, and, and my providing testimony here today is one step towards that educational component. So thank you for asking the question. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there any questions for the bill sponsor? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Representative Gramlich. And um, you can stay in the meeting uh, as a panelist during for the rest of the hearing if you'd like. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate the committee's indulgence. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'm going to um, look at our list and uh, I don't see, oh, I see it, um, a co-sponsor, Sen uh, Senator Bailey, wishes to testify. And so, um, Christian, could you please move Senator Bailey uh, from the attendee to panelist status? If she, I'll check and make sure she's present. I don't see Senator Bailey as an attendee. Okay, yeah, I don't either. Thank you. Okay, so I have um, a list of individuals who wish to testify with regard to this legislation, but I don't have an indication of who is a proponent of the legislation. So I'm speaking to those who are in the attendee um, part of the meeting and would ask that you please use your electronic raise hand function, raise your hand and please keep your hands raised until I've called on everybody who wishes to testify in support of this legislation. Okay, so we'll start um, with uh, Ms. Saxel as our first uh, witness to testify in favor of this legislation. Could you move her uh, to the panel, please? Thank you. And, uh, welcome to the Committee on the Judiciary, Ms. Saxel, and you can uh, proceed. And we do have a three minute limit. I'll let you know um, when we get close to that point. All right, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, members of the committee. My name is Elizabeth Ward Saxel, and I'm here on behalf of the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault, uh, which represents Maine sexual assault support centers across the state, as well as on behalf of Maine's children's advocacy centers um, who engage in the forensic interviews of um, kids who have uh, been suspected of experiencing sexual abuse. Um, and we are in support of the idea behind uh, Representative Gramlich's uh, bill, five, um, LD 589. Um, and so just wanted to kind of throw our support behind it. Um, the bulk of my testimony, I'm um, seeing for the next bill. Um, uh, Representative Gramlich and I have spoken and um, there are sort of two models. Um, and uh, we we favor a model uh, where the, uh, the, the statute of limitations is completely eliminated. Um, as opposed to a window. Um, and so I uh, support uh, Representative Gramlich's uh, intention here to um, open the doors of justice uh, to survivors of sexual violence and appreciate her uh, bravery to speak on these issues and her work um, on behalf of survivors. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there any questions for Ms. Saxel? Not seeing any, thank you for speaking with us today and we'll hear you, you on the following bill as well. Um, Christian, could you please bring uh, Mr. Bigas back into the panel? Welcome back, Mr. Bigas. You may um, proceed with your testimony when you're ready. We can see you, but we can't hear you yet. Can you hear me yes. now? You're good. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me again. Um, 
Senator Kearney, Representative Burnett, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. Again, I'm Michael Begas, I live in Auburn. Um, I represent the Maine Trial Lawyers Association here today who strongly supports LD 589. Uh, no one is safe if perpetrators of sexual abuse are unaccountable. All the victims of sexual abuse should be able to hold their abusers accountable, especially when a governmental entity or governmental actor contributed to the injury. LD 589 would allow victims of sexual abuse to seek justice for claims barred by the MTCA statute of limitations if they come forward within the two year window in the bill and also the, uh, the broader um, amount of civil claims would also be able to be brought, but only within a two year window, which is kind of one of the models that uh, people tracking these similar kinds of bills across the country um, uh, have followed. Other states have a more broad approach um, and just removing it altogether and not, not having just a limited window. Either way, that would be an, these, these changes would be incredibly helpful to help victims come forward. As others have testified today, the nature of ch child sexual abuse injuries frequently results in victims not coming forward for years or even decades because of the nature of the psychological injury and victims survival instincts. Injuries from sex abuse are very different than fractures or other kinds of physical injuries. This legislation is also timely because of child sex abuse was not widely reported and known to be as prevalent when the current law and statutes of limitations were enacted as it is today. The past two decades have brought to light both major abuses and abusers. The legislature didn't have the information we have now to draft a trauma-informed and policy-based law that it does now based on examples of widespread abusers like in the Catholic Church, the Boy Scouts of America, or sports coaches. The average age of adults reporting sexual abuse as a child is 52 years old. Victims should not be prohibited from seeking justice when child sex abuse was going unchecked for years because society favored silencing victims and didn't understand the psychology behind the trauma of children repressing sexual abuse or fear of coming forward. There is a major power imbalance when a child is abused, and if they're pressured to keep quiet by their abusers, they'll, they will stay silent. We, the main trial lawyers urges the committee to support LD 589. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, are there any questions for Mr. Bigas? Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a question um, from Representative Sheehan. You may proceed, Representative Sheehan. Thanks, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Begas, for being here. Um, I wanted to ask, um, do you and the Maine Trial Lawyers Association um, have a position on establishing um, versus eliminating uh, the window in Maine? Well, we, we support this bill, but we would favor the eliminating the window and having, okay. uh, which uh, LD 688 uh, has. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions on the part of committee members? Not seeing any, thank you very much for testifying this afternoon. Our next, um, proponent is um, Cushman Anthony. And if he could, um, Christian, if you could move him into the panel, thank you very much. And Mr. Anthony, you can proceed whenever you are ready. Hello, um, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Cushman Anthony and I live in Yarmouth. I'm a retired lawyer and mediator. I was a member of the House of Representatives from 1986 to 1992 and was a member of this committee during the 114th and 115th legislature. Mr. Anthony, are you able to activate your video as well? I'm sorry. Yep, there you go. There you go. Thank you very much. I'm here not representing any organization in my appearance before you, I'm just here on my own accord. And I'm speaking here today in support of LD 589, though I would certainly support 
uh, 688 as well, to give individuals more lengthy access to the court to seek damages on account of sexual abuse that they experience as children. It often takes many years of therapy before individuals who are victims of sexual abuse as children can admit even to themselves a lot of uh, explanation of that. Um, the sense of shame generated by the offense stands in the way of doing so. And of course, if they cannot acknowledge that to themselves, they are totally unable to tell anybody else about it. As a consequence, many years uh, frequently go by before uh, somebody even recognizes he has experienced it and considers seeking compensation. And by then it's too late. I learned this clearly through becoming friendly with and working with a fellow named Jeff Libby, a prisoner at the Maine State Prison, who is currently residing in the Bolduc unit. Jeff committed the crime of murder when he was a young adult. In defending himself against the murder charge, he could not bring himself to share either with his lawyer or with the judge what had happened to him as a child, even though his failure to do so resulted in getting an inordinately lengthy sentence. In fact, Jeff was sentenced to 45 years in prison, of which he's currently served 34 years and eight months. A forensic psychiatrist who examined Mr. Libby told me that the sex abuse Jeff had experienced as a child undoubtedly was a significant contributing factor in leading him to commit that murder. That is pretty obvious in this case because Jeff's murder victim was in fact his grandfather, the very man who encouraged him to seek help from a priest. And that priest was the man who abused him. Some time back, I spoke about Jeff with Jim Tierney, who was then the Attorney General. He confirmed that the state would have sought a much lesser sentence had the, had the Attorney General's office, oh, I'm, I'll cut this short. Um, but I'm telling, I wanna explain, I'm telling you all of this, not because I'm seeking relief for Jeff, but rather so you will understand how totally a person can become unable to share information about experienced sexual abuse for a very long time. It is unjust to allow victims of child sex abuse to seek compensation only if they do so shortly after experiencing that abuse. A victim is typically unable to do it at that time. So I support passing LD 589 to permit Mr. Libby and others like him to renew his claim for compensation through the courts or to start a new compensation action. That seems fair to me. I hope it seems fair to you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anthony. Committee members, are, does anyone have questions for Mr. Anthony? Not seeing any. Thank you very much for speaking with us this afternoon. I'll hang around. It's nice to see my old committee in action. Yes, we, we, ex, we would have expected some tribute if we were in person. Uh, but I've been here before. So that, that tribute happens the first time only I understand. And I've been before the committee many times since 1992. Oh, I, I, I think we, we kind of expect it every time, but we'll have to that, straighten that, that out. That Thank tradition has evolved, yes. <laughs> Um, all right, thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Anthony. Um, the final uh, person who signed up in advance to testify in favor of this legislation is Jan Collins. Welcome back, Ms. Collins. Thank and, you. And um, you may proceed. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, I'm not going to repeat my testimony. I just want to emphasize, I think, what um, former Representative Anthony has said. Much of what we see as a side effect of this abuse in childhood comes out sideways. And that is responsible for many of the, much of the acting out that we have seen that tends to get people into the correctional system. Um, and that suffering is not resolved by being in the prison, but there is some compensation to be had in the tort law. And we do hope 
that you will extend that indefinitely so there is no time limit on carrying tort claims on sexual abuse. If there are any questions, I'd be willing to take them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. And that was, uh, thanks for the uh, minding the time limit so well. <laughs> Committee members, are there any questions for Ms. Collins? Not seeing any, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm looking now at the attendee space. I just wanna confirm that everybody who wishes to speak um, in support of this measure, LD uh, 589 has already spoken. If not, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. So now we'll turn to those who wish to speak against this legislative measure. And um, I do have a list, but if you could also raise your hand, uh, that helps us keep track. So we'll start with Bruce Garrity testifying against this legislation 589. Hmm. We seem uh, perhaps to have lost him Oh, here he is. Mr. Garrity, you can activate your audio and video and proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Everyone can see me now, I assume? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Carney, uh, Representative Harnett, and members of the committee. My name is Bruce Garrity. I'm here uh, today testifying on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association and the uh, Roman Catholic Diocese of Portland in opposition to uh, LD 589. I, uh, I wanna start and this comment will carry over to uh, LD 688, your next bill. Uh, there's nothing more reprehensible than the kind of conduct that this legislation and other bills of this nature try to address. And uh, uh, there's no excuse for it. Uh, it should be uh, handled aggressively by the courts, by the legislature, uh, and nothing that uh, we say today lessens our view uh, involving how reprehensible this conduct can be. Let me say, however, uh, first, I'm a little bit confused on this specific bill as to how it is relating to actions beyond the scope of the uh, Tort Claims Act. Uh, section 3 proposes to reference Section 752C of Title 14, which is the general statute of limitations, and at the same time reference both the notice and the statute of limitations provisions in Section 8110, which is the Tort Claims Act. What I'll do, if it's okay with you, Senator, is limit my comments to the Tort Claims Act provision, because I think the comments on the broader statute of limitations are more appropriately made on uh, the next bill. I will say if the committee decides to move forward with this legislation, I think you need to look at the interrelation of the Tort Claims Act and 752C. That, having been, that all having been said, I think we all know statutes of limitations exist essentially to provide a sense of fundamental fairness in our process. Plaintiffs need an opportunity to develop facts. Plaintiffs need an opportunity to uh, determine what damages are. Plaintiffs have need to have an opportunity essentially to put together a complaint or a case uh, to present their point of view. Likewise, defendants need the same opportunity. And the statute of limitations balances the time frame for both of those steps to occur. The legislature has decided uh, under section 8110 uh, that that is uh, essentially uh, two years. Um, with an extension if it's a minor. Now, with public records, we have agencies, individuals, entities that keep good records, that have a responsibility to the public, that in, uh, in essence are more closely uh, watched, if you will, 
and observed than private entities. Uh, we heard other people reference, for example, camps. Uh, that's outside the scope per se of the Tort Claims Act. And when companies price their policies, they're pricing it with an eye towards having to defend someone, having to understand what the risks are that are being insured, how to handle those claims, and at the same time, to know how long those claims will be viable. The longer a claim is viable, the longer and the larger the potential exposure, and the more difficulties associated with defending it, and the more expensive the policy. Mr. Garrity, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, your three minutes is up. So if you could just um, wrap up your testimony, please. Uh, well, uh, to be honest, what I'll try to do is, is carry this over to 688 as well. But let me just suggest uh, to close that there is a principle of fundamental fairness here. It doesn't matter what the nature of the wrong is. The statute of limitations exists to provide a balance. We think the balance that's in place is appropriate. We think opening it up after claims have been, have already fully lapsed is uh, not only creating exposure that was never contemplated, it's making it more difficult to defend and handle claims. And Senator thank Connie, you very much. You're giving me a little bit of uh, leeway there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on the part of the committee for Mr. Garrity? Not seeing any, thank you very much, Mr. Garrity. Oh, excuse me, hang on a second. Representative Babbage, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you being nice enough to recognize my last minute. Um, Mr. Garrity, can you comment to me uh, about um, the, uh, well, in, in this case, maybe, maybe it's not as germane. I, I, I was looking about when we contemplate a statute of, of uh, limitations and then implement it. If in fact, uh, there is a situation where the, the previous statute has expired, but, we, but would be included in the new, in the new law, uh, are there any prohibitions uh, that we have to consider in, in those kinds of things? I'm not talking about like a, an ex post facto in a criminal situation, but I, I wondered if you might know of any, any uh, concerns or, or even the way it's been implemented in the past here in the state of Maine. This must have come up. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure representative what your question is going to if it's going to uh, uh, something like constitutionality um, I know those arguments can be raised um, but um, I, I don't think that is the um, I don't think that's really uh, necessarily on point here uh, I think uh, we're talking about uh, remedies not substantive rights right. um, that that having been said I think the consequences the system, costs in the system. And the other thing you have to balance for this uh, two and a half year period is the, the rights and the needs of the individuals who have been, um, uh, who've made um, uh, assertions that they've been subject to this kind of uh, uh, conduct. That's the balance I, I, I appreciate, you have to engage in. I appreciate that argument. I figured you might be the right person to ask if there were other hurdles we could anticipate. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You, Representative Babbage. Any other questions from the committee? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrity. And next we have Carrie Silverman, who's here to testify in opposition to LD 589. Welcome, Mr. Silverman. You can proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Carrie Silverman, and I'm here on behalf of the American Tort Reform Association, which is a national coalition of, of businesses, municipalities, and associations that support a balanced, predictable, and fair civil justice system. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and express our opposition to LD 589 and LD 688's revival of time barred claims. My testimony goes to both bills. I'm not sure if I'll, uh, I, it can carry over if there's um, additional content that I'd like to cover maybe to the next, uh, which is 
mainly what it, it focuses on. Uh, I, I respect the advocacy and the, and the good intentions of the proponents of this legislation. Um, ATRA has no issue with providing a, a very lengthy time period to bring a lawsuit alleging injuries from childhood sexual abuse. ATRA believes, however, that for, for any type of civil litigation, statutes of limitation should be finite and changes should apply prospectively and not revive claims after the time to file them has, has ended. As you may know, Maine has lengthened the statute of limitations for childhood sexual abuse civil actions four times since 1985 and eventually eliminating it entirely in, in 2000. And in each of those instances, the legislature did so prospectively, which is a sound constitutional approach to doing it. The legislation before you today would apply the 2000 law retroactively, allowing claims to go back several decades. And those would be claims that would not only be filed against perpetrators, but also what we're concerned about, negligence claims against nonprofit organizations, businesses, schools, camps, or other private organizations or public entities based on what those uh, organizations at the time knew or didn't know or should or should not have done when it hired, supervised, or monitored employees or volunteers. Atra's concerned with this approach and the precedent it sets for other types of civil lawsuits. Some may view that statutes of limitations as an arbitrary time to bring a claim and, and others may consider them as just a way for defendants to get out of liability on a technicality. But the, the core reason that we have statutes of limitations, which can be overlooked, is to make sure that judges and juries can make decisions about liability based on the best evidence available. They protect accuracy and reliability in the civil justice system. It's, a, it's particularly important when a jury must evaluate what an organization did or didn't do at some point in the past. And the problem with retroactively allowing lawsuits dating back decades is that in many instances, the perpetrator will be dead. The employees that worked at the organization are, are gone or dead too. And any, or, any records of the organization will have long been discarded. And whether the entity is a daycare center or a school or other program, the ownership or management of that changed hands. Um, a jury is gonna be faced with a, a person who has no doubt experienced abuse, but, but will have uh, an organization before it that has little or no evidence available to it. And the liability will be looked at in hindsight. Um, I, thank you very much, Mr. Silverman. You. Your three minutes is up. Thank you very much. Let me see if committee members have some questions for you. Uh, committee members, uh, Representative Harnett has his hand raised. You may proceed with your question. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Silverman, did you submit written testimony, written comment? I did not have uh, an opportunity to do so, but if that would be helpful, I could follow up and, and provide that. Okay, and, and did you say you represent the American Tort Reform Association? I, I could not hear an answer. That's correct, yes. The American Tort Reform Association. And is that primarily made up of large Fortune 500 companies and insurance companies? It's made up of a very wide range of, of organizations uh, across the country. Okay, thank but, you. Yeah. Committee members, are there any other questions for Mr. Silverman? I am not seeing any. Thank you very much, Mr. Silverman. That takes us, I believe, to our final um, person who's here to testify pertaining to this bill, and that is Julia Flynn, testifying neither for nor against um, on behalf of the Maine Judicial Branch. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Finn, and you may continue, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. I'm Julie Finn, and I represent the Maine Judicial Branch. Um, I just have a couple of quick comments about this bill. Um, the Judicial Branch takes no position on the substance and the very worthy goals of the bill. The issues, in fact, raised in the LD fall squarely within the policymaking realm of the legislature. However, we do have um, some minor concerns about the provisions requiring priority scheduling and judicial training, um, recognizing that cases involving harm to children are of the utmost importance. Our courts hear many such cases. 
including many, manner, many matters centering on children and families, such as child protection cases, cases involving the determination of parental rights and responsibilities, and others. And the courts also hear cases not involving children that are very important, um, requesting mental health commitments, protection from abuse orders, juvenile management and treatment, and intervention in many other critical situations that are extremely important to those involved. Our courts are accustomed to prioritizing important matters and it should be left to the courts to continue to do so. Similarly, the judicial branch takes training its judges, justices and clerk's office staff very seriously. During our three administrative weeks per year, educational sessions are conducted often with outside experts. If the proponents of this LD have suggestions about sources of critical information, we would welcome the opportunity to fit this topic into our schedule. Keeping current on legal and societal issues is very important and something we work hard to accomplish. Thank you for your time. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Committee members, does anybody have questions for Ms. Finn? I am not hearing any questions and I know you recently did provide us with a lot of information about the judicial training program. And so I think we all have that in the backs of our minds or even the front as well. Thank you very much for um, appearing this afternoon. Thank you. I, I'm gonna um, just make one final call for anybody who wishes to testify either in support of, in opposition to, or neither for nor against. LD 589. And I'm looking at the attendee list. I'm not seeing uh, any hands raised. And so um, with that, we will close the hearing on LD 589. And now we'll open the public hearing on our final piece of legislation for this afternoon. And that is LD 688. And it is sponsored by Representative Michael Brennan. And I believe he is with us this afternoon. And we'll just give him a minute to join. And uh, Representative Brennan is joining us. Uh, he has to exit one committee meeting and join us in this committee meeting. So it'll be just a moment, everyone.
And uh, Representative Brennan has just joined us. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Representative Brennan. We're not able to hear you. Unmute at this point. So are you ready to start? We are ready for you and um, we're, we welcome you and are um, ready to hear your introduction of LD 688. Thank you very much, Senator and Representative Hardnett and members of the committee. I'm Michael Brennan. I represent District 36, which is part of Portland. And uh, hopefully you see, received the written testimony that I have submitted. And I don't intend to read that uh, verbatim at this point, um, but uh, kind of cover a little bit of the highlights and make a, a couple of additional uh, comments. But um, I, I'm very happy to be here today to present this bill, given that I started work on it. I first submitted the bill in October of 1999, 19, uh, 2019, and it uh, was tabled by legislative council. So it did not get into consideration in 2020 in the second session of the 129th legislature. So during the last year and a half, uh, I've worked on this bill with stakeholders, with other interested groups. I've consulted with uh, the attorney general's office. And I believe that, um, uh, what is being presented to you is, is very straightforward and, and fairly concise. And in fact, uh, the entire bill is 40 words long, one sentence with one punctuation, which is a period. And yet, uh, if this committee and the legislature and the governor sign this bill into law, it will have a positive effect on hundreds, if not thousands of people across the state of Maine. And what the bill does is remove statutory limitation on uh, persons that have been victimized by child abuse, uh, sexual abuse, and be able to um, uh, have their day in court, have their voice in court, um, and not have time limits be a restraining uh, factor in terms of them being able to uh, 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 seek justice in terms of the uh, abuse that has occurred. Uh, why this is important, uh, again, in my testimony, I point out uh, the number of people that have been victimized by uh, childhood sexual abuse, and it runs anywhere from 25 to 30% for women and anywhere from 10 to 15, 20% uh, for young men. I, I will say, um, a number of years ago, I worked at the Maine Youth Center and one week they were shorthanded uh, staff. And so they asked me uh, to take over staffing of the sexual abuse uh, cottage at the Maine Youth Center. So all the youth that were there um, had been convicted of some type of uh, 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 sexual impropriety that uh, resulted in them ending up at the Maine Youth Center. But an uh, overwhelming majority um, had also been victimized themselves. And I think that this bill is a, a, a terrific step forward in terms of breaking that cycle of abuse uh, that we end up seeing because it, again, it will give voice uh, and people will know that if they are victimized, they will have an opportunity uh, to uh, uh, confront uh, the perpetrator and have their day in court. So um, I, the bill may look as if um, it's not uh, uh, fairly uh, lengthy and that it may not um, have a lot of verbiage to it, but I assure you um, that it is a, a significant step forward and that it addresses a, a longstanding issue in terms of removing the statute of limitations and allow people to have uh, their day in court. Lastly, uh, last week I had the opportunity to be on a conference call with uh, Irish legislators across the country. And we also had on the call legislators from Ireland themselves, other elected officials in, in the state of Ireland. And so today um, I, I'd like to wish everybody happy St. Patrick's Day, but I'd also like to express uh, special support for those people uh, both here in the United States and in Ireland that were victimized 
in institutions uh, when they were young people. And, and again, um, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity today to express that. And I hope uh, on this day of St. Patrick's Day that you will choose to support this bill and we will make a significant step forward in terms of uh, 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 enabling people that have been victimized uh, to have their day in court. So thank you very much. And um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have at this point, knowing that you've probably already had uh, some level of discussion at this point. Thank you very much, Representative Brennan. Uh, one question that I have for you, and I think other committee members might as well, is can you speak to us a little bit about the retroactivity aspect of this bill? Well, I, I can uh, represent Cardi, but I'm going to say right at the beginning, I'm sure that you already know more um, about the retroactive part uh, than I do. Uh, what I'll say, I, I can explain to you the evolution in thinking, which uh, uh, may ha ha have already been mentioned. But in 2019, when I first submitted the bill, I modeled it after New York, the state of New York, which had a time limited uh, look back on the statute of limitations. And I believe at that time it was one year. Um, since then, there have been several states, Vermont, Massachusetts, and others that have, uh, rather than just taking a time limited look back in the statute, have just eliminated the statute of limitations entirely. And that's what this bill does, um, that rather than having been an incremental time limited uh, look back in the statute, it uh, actually allows for uh, unlimited time frame. Now, I understand that the state, and I believe it was 1999, uh, took uh, steps to address uh, the statute of limitation uh, issue, and that was a very positive uh, uh, step. And I was here, at, I was in the legislature at the time and voted to support that. Um, I think this is the final step that needs to be taken um, to cover those people that were uh, left out of the reforms that were made in 1999. Thank you very much, Representative Brennan. And you uh, exactly explained what I was asking and what I think the committee was thinking about. So we well, thank you. And it's rare if ever I exactly answer the question uh, correctly. <laughs> well, it's St. Patrick's Day, right? Right. We got a lucky day. Um, <laughs> Committee members, um, are there any questions for Representative Brennan, uh, Representative Harnett? Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, uh, Representative Brennan. Um, do you know, I, I know that Vermont did what you're asking for here in, I believe, 2019. Do, do you know if that's been challenged at all in Vermont? Do I know what the challenge was? Did, did you know if, if the did elimination- was challenged? Correct. I, I do not know at this point. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that might be something I would I'd actually, I, I would ask the analyst to uh, right. find that out. Well, for well, well again, I, uh, the bill uh, was reviewed by the Attorney General's office. Um, and and I'm not, not, I don't want to imply at all that they support the bill or endorsing the bill. Um, but I did take the step of having them review the bill. And obviously, you know, there were, there were some issues that were raised uh, that I think the committee will wrestle with as you go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, committee members, is, are there other questions for Representative Brennan? I'm not seeing any. Representative Brennan, you're welcome to stay um, on the panel during the conclusion of the hearing or to well, head back to education. It's well, I, I may stay for a short time, but uh, we're in, immersed in a uh, scintillating debate about uh, career te technical education and the school, the funding formula. And I, I certainly don't want to miss that. Okay. <laughs> we are going, <laughs> we're going to call the, the, our first proponent. Um, and let's see, I believe that is Amy Good from Topsom. Amy, would you, um, Christian, could you please bring Amy onto the panel?
And Ms. Good, you can um, activate your audio and video and start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Amy Good. I'm a resident of Topsom. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, the Associate Director at Sexual Assault Support Services of Midcoast, Maine, a therapist, and a sexual violence survivor. I'm here in favor of LD 688, an act to promote justice for victims of childhood sexual abuse to ensure that minors who have been sexually victimized have as many pathways for justice as possible. First, I'd like to, you to imagine me as a four-year-old because that's the first time that I experienced gross sexual assault. Concurrently and unbeknownst to me, a relative was also being regularly violated by this person. Fast forward, I've done a lot of healing work. I'm still healing, but my relative can barely tolerate thinking or talking about what happened to them, even though it's been over 30 years. Sexual violence towards minors is common. Every nine minutes in the US, a child is sexually assaulted, leaving a lifetime of harm in the aftermath that they must navigate. The vast majority of childhood sexual abuse survivors, nine out of 10, have their bodies and boundaries violated by someone that is known to them, someone in their social orbit, whether a relative or someone who has access to them. Like me and so many others, it can take years, even decades for kids to share what happened. And these de delayed disclosures are typical. They are the norm. Child sexual abuse can be confusing, scary, shrouded in secrecy, involve threats and manipulation, feel shameful. The aftermath can be devastating. I have worked with countless adult clients who are just now getting to the point of telling, of seeking support, and of exploring their options for justice, including what little our own legal system can provide. So many of us have just spent energy surviving, trying to make meaning of our experiences and crawl out from underneath them. Each person's path towards healing is different. Our justice system is supposed to help ensure that victims have options and that people who have harmed them are held accountable. Rarely do sexual assault cases get prosecuted criminally. Our civil justice system can and should provide victims time, time to decide what action is best for them and what will bring them catharsis. It owes it to survivors to be ready and responsive when victims find their voice and when they choose to reclaim some of what is lost, including through civil remedies. We should all be centering the voices and the needs of those who have been sexually victimized as children to make sure that they have every possible avenue for healing and justice. I urge you to support this bill. I thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Good, for your testimony today. Committee members, does anybody have questions for Ms. Wood? Ms. Good, excuse me. Not seeing any questions. We appreciate your being here this afternoon. Thank you. The next uh, person we have um, signed up to testify in support of the legislation is Ms. Saxel. Welcome back, Ms. Saxel, and you can uh, proceed whenever you're ready. Hello again, Senator Carney, Representative Parnett, members of the committee. My name is Elizabeth Ward Saxel, and I'm here again on behalf of the Coalition Against Sexual Assault um, and Maine Sexual Assault Support Service uh, providers, as well as Maine Children's Advocacy Centers in support of LD 688. Um, I know Representative Brennan um, mentioned that uh, there have been conversations with the Office of the Attorney General, um, and I, I spoke at length with the ADA who is uh, involved in looking at this bill and working through the case law, et cetera, um, yesterday. And, and he wanted me to pass on that um, they would be very pleased to come and, and uh, provide some analysis uh, at the work session should that be something the committee would like. In 1999, I was hired as Mikasa's executive director. On the scope and impact of sexual violence happened in the next session and the next. In those years, this committee grappled with how to respond to the realization of widespread sexual abuse at the Governor Baxter School for the Deaf. Um, I know uh, Peggy Reinch put in countless hours um, working on that compensation fund. 
At the same time, the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee and your committee were hearing additional heartbreaking accounts from childhood sexual abuse victims who were barred by statutes of limitation from seeking criminal and civil justice. Many of those accounts shape the way that I think about these issues and they stay with me. I typically um, focus on stats and, uh, and on uh, research and science, um, uh, but uh, this one um, because of um, uh, the way that I came into this work. I particularly remember the brave and self testimony of a family from Androscoggin County. One of the siblings was finally in a place to share his experience of child sexual abuse by a family member with his siblings. As it turned out, they all thought they were the only ones. When they were ready to collectively seek justice, they found the statute of, statute of limitations had just run. They knew that the bill they were submitting helped them um, because it was uh, designed to be um, prospective, but they were adamant. No matter how painful it would be to tell their stories per publicly, it was worth it to ensure that future victims had access to justice. As a result, the legislature, as you've heard, removed both the and civil statutes of limitations for child sexual abuse. They recognize the unique impact of this uh, abuse has on children that you've been hearing about and changed the law uh, to allow them to seek justice no matter how long ago the abuse occurred, the last year, 10 years, or 60 years ago. They understood the reasons why it can take many years for victims of child sexual abuse to talk with anyone, let alone publicly, about the abuse they endured. They recognized the importance of allowing victims access to justice and the ways it could improve public safety. But by enacting those changes prospectively, they also left those behind. I urge you to open the doors to justice for people like Mary and Lisa, who you'll hear from today, for the siblings from Androscoggin County who stay with me, and also those who have support, so, sought support through Maine Sexual Assault Support Centers, and perhaps most importantly, those who have not yet shared their stories with anyone. The very act of being able to engage in this kind of process can be a key part of healing. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, we hope that you will support L688, and I'd be pleased to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, does anyone have a question for Ms. Saxel? Not seeing any raised hands. Thank you for uh, returning again this afternoon. Thank you for your time. The next uh, person who signed up in advance is Catherine Robb. And um, Catherine, you'll be moved shortly from the attendee to the panel. Welcome and uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee and you can proceed with your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, my name is Catherine Robb. I am the Executive Director of Child U.S. Advocacy, where we work in all 50 states to pass child protection legislation. I am also a survivor of child sexual abuse. There is clearly a worldwide epidemic of child sexual abuse with at least one in five girls and one in 13 boys being sexually assaulted before their 18th birthday. That is 13% of all children. This affects all children. It exists in all social, religious, cultural, political groups. The headlines of Larry Nassar, or Jeffrey Epstein, uh, Jerry Sandusky are really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, like most ep epidemics, it's ubiquitous. But most abuse occurs in the families. Sexual abuse also silence the vic uh, silences vic victims. The silencing allows perpetrators to hide behind this archaic statute of limitations. The average age, as you've heard already, that a victim discloses is age 52. I was in my 40s when I first spoke publicly. This problem generates many costs that place a significant burden on Maine's healthcare, education, criminal justice, and welfare systems. Nationally, the cost is in the billions. The average cost of child maltreatment per victim is 830,000. Victims and Maine taxpayers have been left to bear the tremendous cost of this abuse as victims suffer from neurodevelopmental issues, impaired social, emotional, cognitive development, psychiatric and physical disease, disability, 
educational struggles, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, substance abuse, alcoholism, and sadly, suicide. Child abuse victims in Maine are disproportionately in need of medical care and other governmental support. As to the constitutionality, I'll just touch briefly on that. The due process clause of the Maine Constitution, Article 1, Section 6A, permits retroactive legislation as long as it is enacted to further a legitimate legislative purpose with rational means. And the Maine Supreme Judicial Court in Tomskin, in, excuse me, in Tomskin v. Ray, uh, Wade and State v. Eaton, this is, by the way, in my written testimony, has articulated the test to, uh, as to whether retroactive legislation, one, provides for the public welfare, two, the means are appropriate to achieve, to achieve those goals, and three, the manner is not arbitrary or capricious. This three-part test is clearly satisfied in LD 688. Clearly, revival windows for child sexual abuse serve a compelling state interest in one, preventing future uh, abuse by exposing hidden, hidden predators, educating the public. If I can also just say that Maine should look to other states, uh, especially their neighboring states of Massachusetts. The Maine, uh, excuse me, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court held in the landmark, in landmark Sliney case that the retroactivity- Ms. Rob, in, we have yes. a, a three minute limit yeah. and your time is up. Is this information in your written testimony as well? It, it, it is, yes, it is. Um, I just wanna- one wrap up sentence, please. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, since 2002, 37 states have, um, and the federal government in DC have amended and extended their statute of limitation. 20 of those are uh, revival legislation. 30 states this year, and I'll finish with this thought, uh, Senator, 30 states this year, and we're only in March, as we know, have already introduced SOL reform bills. 17 of those are revival. Um, and this morning, Kentucky passed a five-year window, and that is off to the governor to be signed into law. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that um, Representative Evangelos has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Rob. Um, Representative Evangelos, we your um, video is not activated. Thank go. you. I got my mic on at least. <laughs> I hate this stuff. I wish we were meeting in person. Um, thank you, Ms. Rob, um, for your testimony. I just had a quick question. Um, I Somebody called me out of the room and I missed part of your testimony. And I walked in on the part where you said that there's a due process clause in the main constitution that allows for retroactivity. Um, could you just review that piece of it? I wanna make sure I got that right. Um, sure. Um, in the main Supreme Judicial Court decided in the case of Tompkins v. Wade that um, if retroactive legislation passes a three-part test of one, providing for the public welfare, two, that the means are appropriate to achieve that goal and that the ma manner in achieving it are not arbitrary or capricious. And I would argue that that um, would be satisfied in LD 688. Um, and also I think the, the other thing to consider there um, is that there is a strong public policy to pass um, this type of legislation. I mean, I know that um, many folks will argue and cry, it's not fair, how about due process? And I, I can just say this much, as an attorney and as an American, I believe in due process, but we all need to remember the constitutional rights are not absolute. And, and then additionally, that there are safeguards in place, right? We have the rules of evidence, we have the rules of civil procedure, plaintiffs still have to prove their case. So as to that due process argument, I think both the case law in Maine and by the way, the case law in Massachusetts and Vermont that gets the gold medal support this type of legislation, um, as well as the compelling interest of the state to protect its children. Thank you very much for that. So um, to be just to assist me in my research, it, um, it wasn't a constitutional main constitutional reference. It was the Supreme Court case Tompkins versus Wade. That is correct. And, and they were citing a uh, state uh, versus Eaton. E-A-T-O-N. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you so much. 
Committee members, does anyone else have a question for Ms. Robb? Not seeing any raised hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Robb, for providing the information this afternoon. Thank you, Senator. Our next um, witness is going to be Lisa Maysher, who I believe is uh, in the attendee space and is moving over to our panel. Welcome. Uh, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? It's Mashore. Mashore. Yeah. Welcome, Ms. Mashore, to the Judiciary Committee this afternoon. And um, you may proceed with your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Lisa Mashore. I represent myself and other unheard victims, and I reside in Sydney. I'm here in favor of LD 688 because my half brother, Christopher Mashore, sexually molested me throughout my childhood and teenage years, and yet there's no public record of it. He continued to make more victims, and despite three other sexually related convictions, he recently had succeeded in weaseling his way into a school system working with underage females. I tried to stop him legally since the statute of limitations had been lifted placing this crime in a category akin to murder. Yet despite the evidence, I was denied the opportunity to tell my story because of when I had been assaulted. I couldn't even get into a court because I was assaulted too early. The state's message to me was, we don't wanna hear it, you waited too long. The message to him was, you have our permission to continue offending. And the message to the new victims we're not even thinking about you. Our system is deeply broken by the default of its design. It's aiding perpetrators in assaulting young, helpless children. Just imagine someone you love finally mustering up the courage, desperate and eager to finally tell someone why they always flinch when you try to touch them. But instead of listening, you cover your ears and scream, I don't want to hear it. Go away. You've waited too long. When I confronted Chris as an adult, he chuckled and bragged and said, I have lived rent free in your mind for all of these years. He was right. And even though it would be impossible to collect, isn't the civil courts the ones that handle evictions and judgments for back rent, supposedly? But the opposition to this bill, who may be focused on money over humanity, who doesn't even seem to trust our judiciary process or the court's ability to make decisions, will try to say it's not right or fair to punish people retroactively, except the opportunity to have the courts listen to the accusations is called a hearing, not a punishing. This antiquated law is stonewalling victims by preemptively preventing a hearing. Removing the statute of limitations retroactively and allowing victims to be finally heard could help put an end to this type of trauma and ensure public access to vital information needed in order to make informed decisions about who has access to our children. But right now, these outdated limitations thwart the judiciary process, hide information, and help sexual offenders penetrate our child's protective boundaries so that they can become intimately involved with them, creating a perfect environment to woo, groom, and molest. You can change this. Trust our courts. Open the doors for hearings and not predators. Thank you for your consideration, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much um, for providing your testimony this afternoon. Um, committee members, are there any questions for Ms. Mashore? Not seeing any. Again, once again, thank you for uh, providing your testimony. Thank you. And next we have Mary Banks, who is also signed up to provide testimony this afternoon.
Hello? Hello, Ms. Banks. We can see and hear you. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, and you can proceed with your testimony whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Mary Banks. I'm currently a resident of Narragansett, Rhode Island. I'm here in favor of Bill LD-688. My heartbreaking story of child sexual abuse began in 1972 when I lived in Cumberland, Center, Maine, was an honor student at Greeley High School and a member of the Catholic Youth Organization, or CYO. At this time, I served as the Maine Diocesan CYO Secretary, and in this role, I visited many Catholic parishes throughout Maine. In my travels, I met a priest in Bangor. In 1972, at several CYO events, this priest sexually assaulted and raped me. Sadly, I told absolutely no one. I was an innocent 16-year-old girl from a strict Catholic family. I was frightened and ashamed. I could not come forward with an accusation of clergy sexual abuse for fear of the toll it would take on my devout mother and my family. My concealment was not unusual. Current research shows that child victims often wait years, even decades, before they tell anyone. Many children do not even fully recall their sexual abuse until they are in their mid-50s or beyond. Survivors who have kept their secrets and internalized their pain need to be able to come forward in their own good time. Whatever their reasons, victims must not be compelled by legal timelines to report their assaults before they are emotionally or developmentally ready. I only recently remembered the details of my assaults after finding old letters from that priest. Because my abuse happened in 1972, I am time barred from taking any legal action against my abuse. The 1999 Maine bill that eliminated the civil statute limitations for child sexual assault was not retroactive. LD-688 would correct this. LD-688 would allow survivors access to the courts and legal processes. Recent news reports have shown that child sexual assaults are frequently covered up by churches and others. Without legal remedies, survivors historically have had to rely solely on weak and uninspired internal investigations by these same organizations. All survivors should have the legal right to discovery and the opportunity to learn whether others were complicit in their abuse. The most compelling reason to pass LD-688, however, is for the protection of this generation's children. Child advocates have legitimate fears that past perpetrators might still be molesting minors. LD-688 can help identify and flush out sexual predators who have up to now eluded prosecution. In my case, my abuser left Maine in the 1970s and subsequently worked in a Massachusetts public school system. Astoundingly, he still was allowed to chaperone teenagers on church-sponsored trips. Therefore, I implore you to please support LD-688. Survivors deserve the opportunity to have their voices heard and hold our abusers accountable. We should not be forgotten because our assaults happened years ago when child sexual assault was not well understood. Time has not healed our wounds. Thank you very much. And I'll answer any questions I can. Thank you, uh, Ms. Banks, very much for providing testimony this afternoon. Let me check in with committee members. Does any committee member have a question for Ms. Banks? I'm not seeing any. Um, once again, thank you for appearing this afternoon and providing um, testimony to our committee. Thank you. Um, let's see, our um, next on the list is um, returning Mr. Attorney Michael Bigas. Um, welcome once again. You can um, proceed when you're ready. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you once again, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. Again, my name is Michael Begus from Auburn. I'm a trial attorney at Berman and Simmons. I'm a past president of the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. I'm here to represent the trial lawyers who strongly support LD 688. No one is safe if perpetrators of sexual abuse are unaccountable. The right 
to a civil jury trial protected in the US and main constitutions is society's great private enforcer. It incentivizes everyone to be safe and law abiding by allowing a victim to pursue damages, damage claims against wrongdoers. All victims of sexual abuse should be able to hold their abusers accountable. Many real meritorious cases are turned away each year because of the current law. It is heart-wrenching to explain to a victim that they cannot seek justice because of the statute of limitations. I turn away so many each year that I have a form letter that I modify for each one that explains the legislative history in detail and why they cannot bring their meritorious claim. Before 2000, Maine law told the sex abuse victim, either you come forward and face your abuser in it was first two years, then it was six years once they turned 18, or the state will assume, as one judge put it fairly recently, you just stuck your head in the sand. That made them silenced. What a horrible policy that diminishes the rights of a child. Now, I represent several victims of abuse and sexual assault in the current federal bankruptcy litigation concerning the Boy Scouts of America. Over 83,000 meritorious claims nationwide have been brought. Those are allowed because state statutes of limitation often will not apply in the federal bankruptcy court. However, several of those cases which involve local councils as well may end up in the state courts, including Maine, which would apply the current statute of limitations. There are 362 of those claims in Maine, 362 Boy Scout claims in Maine, probably most of which would be affected by LD 688. I represent eight of those 362. There are so many other types of sex abuse cases out there. If LD 688 passes, victims' claims will be screened very carefully using the same standards for merit for new <clears throat> cases. Um, is my time, how much my time? You have a half a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, rule 11, the threat of motions to dismiss, sanctions, and attorney discipline for bringing non-meritorious claims that uh, you can be assured that there'll be only those with merit come forward. As others have testified, the nature of these sexual abuse injuries results in victims not coming forward for years or decades because of the nature of the psychological injury and the survival instincts. Um, I'm prepared to talk about the um, constitutionality um, and I, I and, and can give the committee exactly the kinds of words that it would wanna make in a finding in its legislation, if it if it rules out uh, reports out a bill, uh, finding that this is a narrowly uh, tailored um, le a bill to meet a compelling state interest to protect children, reduce healthcare costs of abuse victims, and prevent further sexual abuse by identifying abusers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the information that you just recited regarding the constitutional findings is that included within your written testimony. No, I just listened to Mr. Garrity and Mr. Silverman from the prior uh, hearing, and um, and I thought that Kath, Ms. Catherine Robb did an excellent job in her testimony on this bill, and um, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for providing that information. I see that a uh, committee member has a question for you, uh, Representative Babbage. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Biggis, again. Um, uh, could you just clarify for me your reference to the 362 cases? Um, what what uh, difference might this provision provide? Is there an expansion of the legal grievance or something to help me to clarify? Understand that, would you? Sure, it's a topic that you know takes a long time to explain. But in in essence, you you you, you all may have heard that the uh, the Boy Scouts of America has claimed bankruptcy and they want to finance the. Uh, damages for abuse victims, and they they estimated tens of thousands of fewer that that applied, but eighty three thousand meritorious claims have come forward. Um, th there's not enough money or assets or insurance in that bankruptcy to properly compensate all of them. So, the Boy Scouts are calling on the, the National BSA is actually calling on the local troops, the local councils. The councils are really where there are assets, insurance, and property to fund those abuse claims. So there are going to be um, thousands of hybrid uh, claims that are federal bankruptcy and local counsel um, that'll go to trial. And they will, they will, they will, I predict there'll be hundreds in Maine. So there'll be, uh, this would be like, you know, the Pine Tree Council um, and the Katahdin Council in Maine. 
um, that will be um, named jointly with the national BSA. Um, and so on those hybrid claims, the state and local state uh, statutes of limitations may be applied. Um, that's a little unclear right now, but. Um, when, you, when you say hybrid, you mean federal and state? So in the federal bankruptcy, in the federal bankruptcy claim, there's no statute of limitations that apply. So uh, a, a victim of sex, ab child sex abuse that this bill addresses can go to that unique one-off federal bankruptcy case and get um, and, and, and make their claim. But there's not, there's, there, there are about twice as many claims as they anticipated. And, and there's sort of like not enough money to go around. So the national BSA is calling on all the local councils to um, come in and help fund those. And the way they fund those is, is actually by having the, um, the claims litigated in court so they can like learn about the damages, find out, you know, the truth of the matter. Find out I guess the what, Mike, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is there are already 362 cases you're talking about. BSA only. <laughs> in our state. And, and are you talking about are those federal claims or are they, yes. are, have they already used the state courts for this? In They're fed, federal, federal bankruptcy and they have not used the state, um, uh, their state court remedies. So, so would this uh, issue before us today change that or and in what manner if it would? Um, I'll just try to be as specific as possible and not like le use legalese. Um, the federal bankruptcy claim may allow abuse victims recoveries of between six thousand dollars and twenty five thousand dollars, maybe more. I, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm. That's that's kind of like a guess. Their claim may be really worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or or even more. Um, so the the opportunity to make their abusers accountable and the organizations that often knew about the abuse and failed to prevent or failed to enforce their prevention guidelines would escape liability under Maine state law. Okay. Thank you. And I see that Representative Hagan also has a question. You may proceed, Representative Hagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, Mr. Biggis. Uh, I missed the last meeting and I missed all of this until the last person came in. I apologize. I had other duties to fulfill. And can you send your, what you, your monologue that you, uh, <clears throat> that you came and talked with this committee? I'd be interested in getting those numbers and having all that. I think that'd be helpful. And, and I'm probably sure that it's been said, and I apologize if this has been said before. What is the statute, statute of limitations on these, these things? So the, uh, right now, the, uh, for, th there is no statute for current claims. Like if somebody got abused yesterday, there's no statute of limitations. But for those that were abused as children um, before the main legislature changed the law, four times, four or five times between uh, the late 80s and 1999, which went into effect in 2000. Um, those, uh, those claims are expired by the statute of limitations because when the Maine legislature uh, changed the statute, they, they kept extending, but they did it only prospectively. They sort of grew, they grew the statute of limitations from uh, the current to the uh, out. They did it once for uh, two to six years after age 18. Then they went from six to 12 and then they went, I think that's when they went from 12 to unlimited. Um, but anybody who had already expired their claim was done. Okay. Um, and I, I, just, I have to tell you the, the people who have come forward in these Boy Scout claims, they're older, older men. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it, it, it took, it took the acceptance of like the Larry Nassers, the, um, the other sort of larger than life national uh, news stories about abuse and knowing that there was safety in numbers, they weren't going to go this alone for them to come forward. And now that they do, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's, it's light at the end of the tunnel for them and their mental health and knowing that they can be validated, knowing that they can, uh, they can, they can live a healthier life as a survivor. Thank you. Committee members, are there any additional questions? 
Not seeing any. So thank you very much for providing your testimony on all three of these bills this afternoon. Thank you. And that brings us to, we have two more witnesses who are speaking in favor of this legislation. One may not be here and that's Reagan Thibodeau. Is Reagan Thibodeau present? I do not see them as an attendee. I agree with that. And then, so finally, um, the last proponent is Reverend Lorraine Cleves Anderson. Reverend Anderson, if you, um, you'll be moved onto the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Welcome, Reverend Anderson. We are very uh, pleased to have you join the Judiciary Committee this afternoon, and you may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary. My name is Reverend Lorraine Cleves Anderson. I live in Boston, but grew up in South Portland. I adamantly support passage of Legislative Bill 688 to offer justice and hopefully closure to many like me who have grappled with long-term effects of childhood sexual abuse, often left unreported, buried, untreated, and unresolved. My South Portland Junior High School eighth grade history teacher molested me many times between 1961 and 1964. He invited me to babysit for them and always insisted on driving me home. In the car, he would hold my hand, speak of wishing he could marry me, then park by then named Southern SMBTI, where he molested me repeatedly. I eventually told a friend, then my mother, who became livid with me, not him. Remember, this was the early 60s. I sunk into a deep, dark hole and prayed desperately for God's forgiveness, which eluded me for over five decades, until I realized I had been praying the wrong prayer. I needed comfort and exoneration. This teacher needed forgiveness. And just before I retired, I experienced a hard lump in my chest, which I called a deep fatigue. Thanks to expert therapy, I discovered much of what I had endured found its genesis in the teacher's insidious, prolonged sexual abuse. I've suffered anxiety, deep depression, an eating disorder, spiritual turmoil, and much more. Worst of all, I could not consistently feel God's love until several years ago when I realized none of what this man had done to me was my fault. It was and is totally his responsibility. He later went on to become mayor of a greater Boston city and is now 89 years old. Had this teacher abused me in Massachusetts, I could have already prosecuted him. So I appeal to you, judiciary members of my beloved home state, please remove the statute of limitations for all survivors and for the protection of Maine society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Anderson, for your testimony this afternoon. Committee members, are there any questions? Of Representative Harnett? Thank you, Madam Chair, and with your indulgence, it's not a question as much as I wanna publicly thank the survivors that came forward today to share their stories with us. And I wanna personally acknowledge their, both their personal and collective courage in doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Harnett. Uh, committee members, are there any other um, questions for Reverend Anderson? Again, we have deep appreciation for your coming to before the committee this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to um, those who 
would like to speak in opposition to this legislation. And we'll begin with Bruce Garrity. Mr. Garrity, you may join us on the panel and speak when you are ready. Hmm. I'm wondering if there is a, oh, here we go. There was a little delay. Um, welcome back, Mr. Garrity. You may proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Carney, Representative Hartnett and members of the committee. Uh, again, Bruce Garrity, this time <clears throat> for the same clients, APCIA and the uh, main Roman Catholic diocese. This is a different bill than the last one. This is a very broad bill. Right now, I think it's important to appreciate that we have a 34 year statute of limitations. That's on the books right now. Next year, it will be 35 years. The year after that, it will be 36 years. Uh, the legislature has expanded the uh, statute several times, um, most recently going to uh, 12 years and then adding on to that the provisions uh, in 2000 that uh, essentially allow those claims to move forward in perpetuity. This bill is only going, I shouldn't say only, this bill is going to address very old claims. And in particular, this is where the cases are almost impossible to depend. This is where there is no evidence. This is where there are no people left. These cases simply can't be effectively addressed in the civil justice system. There's no way to provide each side an opportunity to develop and present its case. On the first bill, I responded to a question by Representative Babbage by saying, I didn't think there would be necessarily constitutional problems with a two-year extension to State Tort Claims Act cases, which have a two-year statute to begin with. This is very much broader. I think there are constitutional implications in this case. And I think at some point, the notion of fundamental fairness comes into play. At some point, you have to look at the perspective of whether people can defend themselves from a claim. Um, as I said, there is no evidence to rely on in many cases. Now, we, as I said, extended our statute in the year 2000, effective 2000 in 1999. There are only two states that I'm aware of that have gone to an open-ended unlimited statute of limitations such as this proposes. I might be wrong on that, but I think it's two states and that's Minnesota and uh, Vermont. There may be a third. So this is not a majority move and when uh, uh, a majority position around the country. And when you look at the bills that are being proposed, for example, you heard about Kentucky, that was a five-year window. That wasn't an unlimited open window. I think there's a very big distinction when you start talking about painting with such a broad brush. And that's where fundamental fairness comes into play. Um, Senator, I, I would ask people when they have an opportunity, if they choose to, to review our written testimony. I think it makes the points, uh, several of the points that I've brushed on, and I would be happy to uh, try and answer any questions the committee might have on 688. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrity. Committee members, are there any questions for Mr. Garrity? Representative Babbage, I see your hand is up and I don't know if that's from a previous question. <laughs> it's actually from a previous question, but I do want to ask him a question if I get a chance, but I'll yes, let my turn. Ahead. It's okay, thank you, I appreciate that. I, I did not do that tactically. Um, uh, Mr. Garrity, uh, if, if I were to ask you to defend a window of whatever time, five years versus perpetuity, what would be your defense of that? Well, I guess my sense at this point is there's virtually no window that would be appropriate. Again, we're talking about the broad base of claims, not under the Tort Claims Act representative. And I think that 34 years and growing is an extraordinary statute of limitations now. And you can always draw a line in the sand. You could always say, well, gee, let's go back three years. Let's go back five years. You've heard about uh, people who express concerns going back to the early 1960s. 
where do you draw the line? Where do you stop? I think you have the statute in place you need to have in place uh, on a broad-based scale. And I don't think we would endorse any expansion of that uh, with all due respect. I guess I hear you, but what I'm saying is I know you would not want us to remove the line, but, but I'm wondering if establishing the line is also an arbitrary act. Oh, I think that's a pretty fair comment. I think establishing any line is an arbitrary act. When we said six years for auto accident cases or the statute of limitations for contracts, we chose an arbitrary limit. Now, most states come down sort of in the same line as us, but those are arbitrary limits. But they're always based on the notion that everyone ought to have a right to be able to either prosecute their view or defend their view. And this takes us well past being able to fundamentally, fairly look at both sides of the question. That's our primary concern with this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gary. Thank you. Are there questions um, that other committee members would like to ask? I do have a question for you, Mr. Garrity. You spoke earlier about um, claims and cases that are very old being, I think you said, almost impossible to defend. Wouldn't you agree that the same problems uh, are problems that are dealt with victims of sexual abuse when, when they are finally uh, emotionally and physically and cognitively able to bring those claims? I think there's a big difference, Senator, and and here's in my mind where it uh, it comes down. I, I heard what was said about Rule 11 and some of the other uh, procedural niceties that are in place. But if you have a person that comes into your office and they they tell you such and such happened and when it happened and they're willing to go in and testify to that, and they have some family members or others they know who say. Uh, this individual uh, reacted in the following ways, or there's a therapist who says this is consistent with. That's enough to make out a case, I think, to go to a jury. I think you've met your prima facie burden. How do you defend against that? Do you just stand up and say, is that true? We don't believe that happened. We don't have witnesses we can call. Uh, we might not have the individual who's still alive. In one case, you heard that the, the, that the, uh, uh, the, per the person accused of uh, engaging in abusive behavior was in his late 80s. Uh, how do you defend those cases? How do you give the jury a fair view of both sides of the case uh, when you have nothing? So I think if, if, if a person can get past a prima facie case, it is extremely difficult to put up any defense with a case as old as some of the ones that are being discussed. In those cases, is the burden of proof always on the plaintiff anyway? It is, and it's a preponderance of the evidence, and that's ultimately gonna to go to what does the jury believe? Who does the jury empathize with? Uh, and as a practical matter, uh, I think we all know that, that juries uh, are uh, essentially a, a combination of all the experiences of all the jurors who are hearing a case. And, um, where will their sympathies lie? Can they get past any sympathy they might have for someone who, who has asserted something so horrible has happened to them? Are they gonna sit there and say, you know what, the defense didn't say anything that this didn't happen. I don't know, that we have the burden of proof on the plaintiff, but I think it's much easier to meet that burden of proof on a, again, on a prima facie basis, just to get the case to the jury. Thank you for your answers. Committee members, are there any additional questions? Okay, I think that um, we thank you for coming before the committee today, Mr. Garrity. And we are ready for our uh, last um, witness speaking in opposition to this legislation. And that again is Carrie Silverman. And uh, Mr. Silverman, you may, um, you'll be moved over to the panel and can proceed um, once you're here. Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee, uh, again, for the 
opportunity to testify on behalf of the American Tort Reform Association. As I testified earlier, ATRA has no issue with a lengthy statute of limitations for childhood sexual abuse claims. Our concern is with the precedent that's being set here in reviving time barred claims and the constitutionality of this approach. If there's time, I could also share with you information on how other states have acted in this area. It's understandable to view child sexual abuse claims as involving such horrific conduct that it should be an exception to the rules we apply to just about every other kind of civil lawsuit. But tort law often addresses catastrophic lifelong injuries. Cases can involve whether a medication caused a child's birth defect, a defect in a car caused an auto accident that killed a family, whether people develop cancer due to exposure to a consumer product, just for example. And as a representative of the plaintiff's bar testified just earlier, those are all heart-wrenching cases and it will always be hard and seem unfair to tell people who have been injured that the time to sue has ended, but it has to be balanced with the public policy of ensuring that juries and judges have witnesses and records available to decide appropriately who is liable in a civil case. If Maine revised time barred claims here, you can expect others to seek similar treatment. I noticed this morning you considered a bill to extend the statute of limitations for exposures to chemicals. That was perspective, but in the future you may see them brought retroactively. Two years ago, I remember seeing this committee consider a bill that would have doubled the statute of limitations, more than doubled the statute of limitations for product liability actions and done it retroactively, reviving time barred claims. That bill was reported ought not to pass. If the legislation before you is adopted, those types of proposals will become more commonplace. It not only sets a troubling precedent to go this route, it's also unconstitutional in many states. I spent some time before this hearing researching Maryland, Maine's constitutional law, and it is consistent with most other states that recognize the legislature can eliminate vested rights, which revive which include reviving time barred claims. What I found is that the Supreme Judicial Court has specifically said in at least seven different cases, seven cases, two of them were the same case, between 1980 and, and 2014, that what a legislature can do is it can extend the statute of limitations to increase the time to file suits where the statute of limitations has not already expired. But what it cannot do is revive time barred claims. And I could share uh, those quotations and citations with you in, in prepared testimony. Um, the most two most recent decisions actually involved the 2000 amendments to the very statute you're considering today. And if enacted this legislation, it may be invalidated and it's only going to give false hope to the survivors who are going to file these lawsuits. And despite what you've heard today, there, there has been significant public pressure, understandably, to get rid of statutes of limitations and do it retroactively. State legislatures, however, have by and large not taken this approach. About one third of states have enacted revivers. In many of those states, revivers were very limited. Some applied only to perpetrators. Some required higher standards of, of conduct beyond negligence. For example, Vermont. Vermont required gross negligence in its reviver. The bill before you doesn't have any of those types of constraints. It's a completely open-ended reviver going back to any time based on pure negligence. Um, thank you for, for again for your time and I'm happy to answer any any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Silverman. Are there any questions for Mr. Silverman? Uh, go ahead, Representative Hagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, been looking around for testimony. Is what you just said part of the testimony? Did you, did you submit that, Mr. Silverman? Representative Hagan, I have not yet submitted it, but if there's a way to do so, I would be pleased to uh, to submit it. Okay. You uh, can go to our legislative website and there you'll see a link for submit testimony and uh, you'll be directed to choose the committee and the LD number. And this is LD 6, uh, 688 uh, for the Judiciary Committee. And that's how, how you would submit it, similar to how you signed up to testify. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Representative Hagan, did you have any other questions? Thank you very much. No, that's that's about it. I can't type fast enough. <laughs> this is, people talk faster than I can type. <laughs> Thank you. Um, committee members, are there other questions for Mr. Silverman? 
if I oh, may. Sorry, yeah. Representative Babbage, go ahead. Thanks. I, I would just like to reinforce uh, that I would look at those references if Mr. Silverman would share them. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Babbage. At this point, it doesn't look like that we have anybody else who signed up in advance. And so I'm just going to make a final um, call for anybody who is here in our uh, electronic meeting who wished to testify in any, with any, in any respect with regard to LD 688. And if that is the case, please raise your hand if you are in the uh, attendee space. And it looks like we've, we've got everybody. And so with that, I will close the public hearing on LD 688 and uh, thank everyone who appeared today uh, before the committee. Committee members, we have a couple of wrap up things related to our budget work that we need to turn to, but I also know that we've all been sitting here for about two and a half hours. So let's take a five minute break. If we can um, all come back together at quarter of four, I think that we can uh, efficiently work through the rest of our, our work today. Thank you very much. And please remember to um, turn off your camera and your audio um, during the break.
Can you tell I have a sunny window? <laughs> I do too. If I lean back just a little bit, I catch it. Really? I have a door. <laughs> that means you're not disturbed. Oh, I'm disturbed. Oh, are we on mic? <laughs> Peggy, thank you for um, doing all this work to get us ready for our budget report out tomorrow. We're, it almost seems like you must have pulled an all-nighter. It was a tremendous amount of work to accomplish. Well, I, I did not pull an all-nighter and I kind of wish I had because I feel like I'm not giving you the complete picture. And I actually talked to, I emailed Maureen and said, oh, yeah. is it all right if we you know, kind of give you a preliminary report tomorrow because all the written stuff isn't going to be there. But maybe you don't need any more written stuff. You, I mean, the wonderful thing is you're going to be there and can talk about, uh, especially MCILS, mm -hmm. and about how, you know, the commission wanted one thing and the committee said, this is what, you know, divided in different ways, but the committee said, this is what we think needs to happen. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, you're going to have to make clear that it's what the committee is recommending. And you certainly got the information from the commission and from Justin Andrus, and, but it's not what they were asking for, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I haven't had a chance to read every single thing you just emailed to us. That's OK. That's um, OK. And actually, if you want to get back to me in the morning, that's OK, too. Well, what would be most, I, I think it would be helpful for the committee to have a, a an overview from you of the documents sure. that you sent us. Yes. And then we can decide as a group um, whether we think we need to do anything more prior to tomorrow. Okay, that would be great. And have, have folks weighed in on their votes with you, Peggy? Um, well, Representative Hagen just called me and he weighed in on um, all the MCILS initiatives and he's decided he's not gonna um, try to get up to speed on the rest of it. So okay. he'll just be, you know, counted as absent. Um, okay. Senator Sanborn is all caught up. Um, I think Senator Keim is working on it and will get to me, okay. <laughs> but she's missed. Maybe, I don't know, since she lost her computer, <laughs> since somebody took it, I'm sorry, it wasn't a loss. I'm really sorry. Well, thank, thank you for doing this. I was wondering what I was going to read tonight. Always count on me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and I did work with Justin Andrus this morning to make sure um, his notes matched my notes about what you were asking for. And, um, he, you know, he and Ellie have the information on numbers. Um, and, you know, he, he wanted to make sure I realized that he was giving me the information you wanted. It wasn't the position of him or the commission. Um, it's what you were asking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so do you wanna take us through what's in the email and, um, and then we can look into what decisions we need to make? Sure, could I just um, share my screen? And, Absolutely. Okay, so um, I, my email had five attachments. Um, and this was the first one. This is the draft memo, and this is what we refer to as the report. And um, it is not detailed. I'm letting the voting sheets and the initiatives do the talking, but it still needs to be correct. <laughs> so if you have some time to review it between now and um, the public hearing tomorrow morning, that would be great and you can get back to me. Um, one thing in particular um, is the language about Park KK. Um, I, this yellow language might be a little too strong, um, but I thought I'd start with it strong and then you can back me off. And this was, um, <laughs> this is a Park KK is the bond language. Yes, do what's in the bill, but what's the next step? Um, is there a next step that you want anybody to, to take or just say, this is something that should be considered? And right here, I'm, I said, we recommend that the legislature consider adding. Um, I, I'll just jump in here because I, I think that um, 
because we haven't had a hearing yet on this topic and the Tort Claims Act is pretty complex that maybe we could change that. Do we recommend the uh, committee consider um, whether to add language? Okay. Yeah. Um, because I think we're, you know, the issue is new enough and our information at this point is limited enough that uh, we should be a little less directive yeah. on that. It, That's it certainly wasn't anything that we were talking about. Um, I mean, we were just using it to explain why right. we didn't need to talk about that now. Um, you know, the, the exception to sovereign immunity. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, well, I will... Representative Libby has a, a point to make, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do appreciate that being added in and and what I, I, the uh, suggestion for the change in wording sounds good to me. Um, I think it's something worth having a conversation about however that needs to happen. So thank you. I think we're all set now, Peggy, thanks. Great, okay. Um, so then the next one is, uh, I'm actually not going to share it. The, well, I'll do it real quick. The big voting sheet. Um, and I know the Senator Sanborn has gotten back to me. Um, Representative, Representative Hagan's all set. So if anybody else wants to register their votes, um, let me know. You'll see that I have identified who voted. I, Whatever the smaller number is, that's whose initials I put down. And then I said, who was absent? Um, and, and you'll see that I marked that on this one, Lois um, record had said that she is voting in favor of that. So that's how I marked it. When it goes to appropriations, it will just, it will be the numbers and I, whichever number is smaller, I'll put the initials um, and I mean, do kind of like this unless you want me to handle it a different way. Do you want to just quickly screen share that, Peggy, so that we're oh, all gosh, on, I'm the, sorry. on the same page? It's, so you I, can't read my mind? <laughs> well, most of the time Not we yet. can, but I think the I'm statute sorry. of limitations on um, <laughs> being really razor sharp expires at quarter of four. Right, right. So so what I, um, what I was saying is, um, this is a report that appropriations wants back is the voting sheet filled in. And um, rather than writing everybody's name down, what I usually do is take the smaller number if it's a divided vote and um, just write the initials down on who's on that side. So I'm not writing everybody down and I'll list who's absent. And, and on this one that I sent you, Representative Reckett had weighed in with me and said, I'm voting yes on that. Since then, Senator Sanborn has weighed in as well. Um, so would that change the vote to, to yes. seven to three? So seven to three, and actually Senator Sanborn voted in favor of it as well. So now it's um, eight to three with three people absent. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Yes, thank you. That was really helpful. So the next thing is, um, the Maine Human Rights Commission revised initiatives mm -hmm. and um, Melody Piper and Lauren Mateer worked really hard to put these together. And so this is, if you remember, the Human Rights Commission was willing to do some reorganization and give up um, some, uh, I think half a position that they were hoping to keep in order to get their, um, technology support. They really desperately need the technology support. So they want to make sure that when you present this, you remind the appropriations that this is a package deal. You can't, you know, um, taking some of it and not all of it will really hurt them and they'd rather go back to um, an earlier proposal. So, um, and it moves some of this money out of federal expenditures into um, general fund. Oops, those are the positions that are gone. Um, so that, that's, they reorganize a position. So 
it's compensated less. So there, there are savings. There's still um, a positive ask from the commission, mm -hmm. but it's it's small. Okay. Okay. Can, in the report back document, the draft that um, had the information about the tort claims issue, did you highlight? Because I didn't get a chance to read through it very thoroughly, that the Human Rights Commission um, budget the new proposal is a package deal, so to speak? No, I didn't. And I will, I can try to reword that to say that. Okay. I can also take a, a look at it when I'm okay. reading through it tonight as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I think the next one is the voting sheet for the MCILS initiatives. And Justin was really, really helpful in putting this together with me to make sure I had the numbers. And I think this is what you wanted, that it was unanimous on initiative one, um, not quite unanimous on initiative two, that was for that additional specialist. Um, three, uh, oh, that means my pages are out of order. I'm really sorry. You're not showing us. Uh... I'm not showing you. <laughs> Haven't you learned to read my mind yet? Okay, now are you seeing this? Yes, thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so initiative five, I've skipped three and four, um, is the per hour um, increase. And here's how um, the Kennebec Public Defender Office shakes out right now is um, report A is five in favor of funding the whole thing starting the second year. Um, three are in favor of, I'm sorry, one is in favor of starting it um, the first year, the whole thing the first year. What? Why are my numbers different? That's not good. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out why this starts with 17 and this one starts with 20. I will have to go back and revisit that. Oh, you know why? Because I'm, know. I'm on the wrong no. page. It's the wrong no. page, sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. So initiative five, initiative six, this is actually part of initiative seven and the rest of initiative six isn't there um, because I put it in the machine and didn't copy all the pages. I will resend that to you. I bet it was the machine. My machine likes to yeah, sort of hide right, right. stuff on me every now and then. Yeah. Um, so if I, can I switch documents? Can you see that? This is the proposed budget language? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. So these are the MCILS proposed budget language changes. Um, the first is the range change for the executive director. Um, the next is, if you remember, Justin Andrews said, you need to make sure that the commission has authority to actually employ attorneys to represent clients. Mm -hmm. So kind of rework that. Um, and added in that the commission must establish a system to audit all financial requests and payments. And that includes the authority to recoup payments when necessary. And this also provides um, Sabina power, which would be enforced through the Superior Court. Um, this is the rulemaking. Section three is the rulemaking. It takes out um, the exception. First, everything's major is routine technical. The exceptions are standards and training and compensation, or it's supposed to be compensation. We're correcting it there. This takes out standards and training as being a major substantive rule, which means they're routine technical. Um, this is actually the authority of the executive director. So the executive director would conduct audits and may exercise a subpoena power of the commission that's granted in the earlier section. Um, and here's the two carrying balance languages. So the end of this fiscal year, carry it into the next fiscal year. Um, and the end of the next fiscal year, carry it into 22-23. So I'm not asking you to vote right now. If you see changes that you want right now, that would be great. Um, I will 
correct the MCILS voting initiatives and send that to you. Um, I'm really sorry. Peggy, um, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at uh, initiative six and I think that I remember that there was a, um, well, now my brain is fuzz, so never mind. I won't try. Yeah, six was the most complicated one, actually. And right, I know. One, that's the one missing a page, so that's why. It... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know right. that when I put my vote in, it was on the one that starts in the second year, I think. Yeah. Okay, so I can. Um... It's the same one that uh, Ann, uh, Rep, uh, Senator Carney voted. So wherever she voted, that's where I voted, according to the circle I made of my little chart here. Yeah. Okay. So here, let me just, this is my word version of it. I think it was four and it's now five, Lois. So I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. So can you see this? Yes, we can. So this, I, I don't have the votes filled in. Um, so this is, so um, this is, there were five that have voted in favor of this, starting it in the second year. This is report A. Um, report B is the whole thing starting in the first year. And that I believe has three votes. And the remaining votes are, um, don't fund it at all in this biennium. I think B, well, maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know, Never mind. But Senator Keim has her hand raised and she's been super patient. Do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, no, it, uh, uh, Senator Keim, did you want to ask your question? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. I just, <clears throat> to, to give the commission, is it giving the commission or just the executive director? I think maybe just the executive director subpoena power is significant and I I don't disagree with it. I just am not, are we sure we wanna do a significant change as part of the budget or does not, does other people not see that as significant? I, I can respond to that. I, I do think that it is significant but I also think it's consistent with the audit power that um, we are strengthening in this proposal. And I, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Peggy, um, where else, what other government organizations have, have audit power? I'm sure there's a lot, but is this sort of in keeping? And, and I actually want them to have audit power. I, I'm actually all in favor of that because I don't think you can have over, I don't think you can have full oversight. So maybe I'm answering my own question. I mean, there's no way to have uh, robust oversight without being able to compel uh, records. Great. So OPEGA has um, subpoena right. authority that I think they mm -hmm. exercise with the um, with the attorney general's office. The language mm -hmm. I used is actually from the um, superintendent of insurance has subpoena power to make sure the insurance companies that are regulated by that bureau, um, mm -hmm. the superintendent can access whatever is necessary. So it's, it's, it's papers, but it's also making witnesses come forward and talk mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, thank you. I just have ha wanted to go over that. I, no, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it because giving somebody subpoena power is a big deal. So um, if what I will do is resend <laughs> um, the MCILS initiatives um, and now that um, Representative Hagan has re, uh, um, weighed in, I will mark it with his. I'm, I think what I emailed you might actually be the whole thing. I'm not sure why it's not showing up online. Um, anyway, I apologize profusely. Um, and if we, if you can get back to me with any changes, tomorrow. I don't want to cut off discussion now. I know you've had a really long day. Is committee members, is there any anything else that that people want to raise with Penny about these documents now? Or do we want to take a look at them tonight and get back to her tomorrow morning? Is it okay if we get back to you in the morning, Peggy? 
That's great. Thank you. All right. Anything else, committee members? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right, everybody. Does anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Representative Libby, thank you. Passed. All right, everybody. So we will um, see each other tomorrow morning. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Goodbye. Hey. Thank you Thanks. all. Bye. Thank you, Christian. No, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Yes, thank you. And do we have a car caucus in the morning before? Yes, we do. Um, I'll text everybody.